Good afternoon. This is the Minnesota Judiciary and Public Safety Committee. For the record, this is Monday, March 11th, 2019. The subject today and the agenda is to hear the bill of Senator Franzen, Senate File 619, regarding recreational marijuana. I uh, first would like to talk about a few of the rules that we have established in the Minnesota Senate. Uh, first, uh, we'll begin with a 30-minute presentation <clears throat> by Mr. Dale Quigley, who is currently the Deputy Coordinator of the National Marijuana Initiative for the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program in the United States. Uh, then Senator Franzen will then present her bill and we will move into testimony by the proponents and opponents of the bill. To respect everyone's time and be as fair as possible, each side was given 30 minutes each to present their side of the issue. Each testifier has been given a time limit and we will be timing testimony according to the limits they were given. All testifiers were asked to sign up in advance of the committee hearing no additional testimony will be taken at this time. Committee members, we will hold questions until all testimony is complete. Our plan is to have the opportunity, first after asking questions and having discussion, we plan on voting on this bill at approximately 3.15 in the afternoon. Uh, we would like to keep our discussion civil and fair today. We're asking that everyone remain in their seat during testimony. Uh, demonstrations like clapping, cheering, sign waving, or other outbursts of any kind by anyone in the room uh, will not be permitted. And should you engage in this activity, you will be asked to leave. Uh, with that, we'll begin with Mr. Quigley. He's a native of Colorado and by virtue of his position with the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program, he has first-hand knowledge of what's happening in Colorado and in other states that have legalized marijuana. Mr. Quigley strongly believes that misinformation and rhetoric about today's marijuana and legalization needs to be replaced with facts stemming from valid scientific research so that individuals and policymakers alike are better able to make informed decisions about the marijuana issue. Uh, his complete bio, bio, bio is uh, in our member packets. So Mr. Quigley, uh, welcome to Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we hope you're, the weather outside is uh, making you feel better at home. Just like being at home, sir. All right. Just like being at home. Uh, you may begin at any time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee members, first off, thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, as you said, my name is Dale Quigley. I am the Deputy Coordinator for the National Marijuana Initiative with the HIDA program. What sets us apart from the other HIDA programs is that we are not an enforcement initiative. Uh, we are about information sharing and about education. That is our sole purpose. We track what's taking place in this country with today's marijuana and try to share that information so people can have a better understanding of what's taking place today and what's taking place with this drug. The issue that we have faced is that this is not a simple issue. This is a very complex issue and it has a lot of consequences and keys to it. When we look at yes, no, right, wrong, red, blue, we can't resolve the issue of legalization with that simple of rhetoric. When we look at the matrix, we, we see that the premise of legalization is built upon premises, spheres of influence, different platforms. But when we boil down to the bottom of this, we're still talking about the legalization of a Schedule I controlled substance, which means by definition, a high probability of for abuse and no accepted medical use in the United States. But yet we want to legalize it because we want to regulate it. We want to legalize it because we want to tax it. We want to legalize it because we can control it. And what we're seeing is that's not always as easily done as it is said. One of the byproducts of this that comes from both sides of the equation in the sense of fairness, and please understand, this is where I come from. We come from the middle. Our information is trying to be unbiased. We try to look at the neutral position of this, try to step back and understand the broader picture of this is taking place. But a common problem to both sides is their minds are made up. Their minds are made up. As the chairman said, one of the things we need to do is to listen to the other sides on this. 
there's a lot of information that can be garnered from listening to both sides and understanding the positions and understanding the facts. But what we need, in fact, number one, is we need more valid research into today's marijuana. We've got strains of marijuana right now being produced at levels that we have never seen before in history. We were told by the industry several years ago that, oh, we'll never see anything higher than 15 to 18 percent THC content. But now we've got 15 and 18 and 20 and 25 strains of raw marijuana with concentrations in excess of 30 percent. We've got concentrates of the 70 and 80 and 90 percent. The research to the effect on that in our bodies, in our society, to our culture, we have no idea. There's lots of good research out there right now. But if it predates about 2012, 2013, a lot of it's just good foundational information. We're lacking research. We're, we're building policy, we're making laws, and we're doing it in a vacuum of understanding what the cause and the effect is. And that's one of the things that we're urging folks to do. Take the time, do the homework, learn what's going on, and understand where the gaps are. If we understand that, we'd do a lot better. Everyone wants to throw data out at you. And I'm not going to be an exception to that either. But we have to understand how to look at data, especially when they want to use Colorado as the source of this data. We look at it from Colorado's standpoint because we were the first ones to go legal by virtue of one time zone during that election. When we look at data, we have to understand data are nothing but seeds of information. And currently what we've got right now is we've got emerging and trending data. But when we look at the topic and we look at specific topics, we may not have some of these answers for another 10 years, 15 years. Some of it may be generational. We don't have that information. We don't have the research to support it. And the caveat I offer to you is that when we want to talk about Colorado being the model to this, we're still figuring it out there too. And we've been doing this for five years now. I've heard it akin to building an airplane while it's in flight. That's a difficult concept to get through, but we're still dealing with the effects of the laws. We've been doing this for five years now. We've got five full years of data. We're still figuring out what the causes and the effects are. As of the end of the election period in 2018, this is what we're looking at. We've got 22 states that have gone medical. We've got an additional 11 states, including the District of Columbia, that have gone from medical to recreational, which, by the way, is the normal sequence of events. For Colorado, it took 12 years to get there. Now we're seeing once the state goes medicinal, within one or two legislative cycles, their sudden push then is to go with recreational, okay? So as we take a look at this, let's look at Colorado as a whole, how we got started on this thing. Back in November of 2000, this was the first initiative that made it to our ballots. This was a constitutional amendment to allow people with certain debilitating medical conditions to have two ounces of marijuana, can have six plants, and can have to elect to have a caregiver to take care of that for them. In the grand scheme of things, me having access to two ounces of weed may not seem like a big deal. But again, step back with me a little bit. If I've got two ounces, you've got two, you've got, this turns into an Oprah show. You've got two, you've got two, and you get a car, and you get a car. Where is the supply for that source of demand? And what's the vertical impacts to them? We'll talk about that in just a second. In 2009, the federal government came out with what was called the Ogden Memo. This was guidance to the Department of Justice and the federal <clears throat> employees about what they're going to do about marijuana. And the first part of the memo read as it should. They recognized the fact that the cartels are making a lot of money out of this. They recognized the danger it has to society. But when you turn the page, it goes, but if you're investigating someone who's in clear compliance with state and local law, we're not going to direct federal resources to this. So what happened was this. From 2000 to 2009, it laid there benign in our state. Very little activity. Around 2006 and 7, you started to see a little more activity leaning toward the medical side. Once this came out, the impression was the state and local guys are doing nothing about it because they can't touch us because it's legal. And now the feds aren't going to do it. The floodgates opened up for us. We went from having just a few card holders for medical card holders. As you can see, we had a, a, just an incredible application spurge. By the time we got to the end of 2009, we went from 4,800 card holders to 41,000 card holders. Application after application came coming in. Shop after shop, dispensary after dispensary are trying to open up so they can make money. If you're going to get in on the bottom floor or something, that's the best place that you're going to find the best profit margin. It's being there at the beginning. What happened, though, by the end of 2010 for us, we had reached such a market saturation in Colorado with the shops that they started self-consuming themselves. Prices came down so low they couldn't sustain a business model. Now it's in competition with one-on-one -on -one with the shops. All these folks invested a lot of money and lost it. One by one, the little mom and pop shops that were there slowly started to disappear. And what came in in its place was large corporate marijuana. 
and they start buying up franchising and doing that type of thing. Right now, that's pretty much what you see in Colorado is the, the mid to large level uh, manufacturers. We, we, this started off actually as a joke, to be honest with you. We were saying that you, know, you can drive through a town and you see Starbucks and McDonald's everywhere, but as you start to drive through Denver, we kept seeing the green crosses and the, the marijuana signs. We reached out to Starbucks and McDonald's in 17, this is the last pull of this data, and asked them, how many shops have you got? And what they gave us is they have had a total of 600 combined shops in Colorado. When we looked at that same time period for our medical and our retail dispensaries, we had almost twice that. And as of just this last March 1st, I pulled some new data for you, we've seen a substantial decline in the number of medical dispensaries and a corresponding increase in retail dispensaries. Because according to the folks that are on the medical side, that's where the money is to be made, is medical retail, not medical by itself. Flash forward, November 2012, this is where we went to recreational. It allowed for one ounce of product for anyone over 21. Essentially, this turned into going into the liquor store. As long as you have a proof of age, you don't have to have a medical card from, issued from a doctor, as long as I can show I'm 21 or older, I can go in and get up to an ounce. Again, we go back to the concept of it's only one ounce. But when you step back and figure if that's availability of one ounce for anyone that's 21 and older, suddenly there becomes the issue of supply and demand. How are we going to meet that supply to meet that increased demand? One of the byproducts we thought of this one, we thought the medical card holders were going to go away. And actually, we were wrong for a couple of years here. For the first couple of years after this, the medical marijuana card was still very coveted and still being possessed at a high number. It's only been in the last couple of years that this number has started to decline. And a lot of it goes back to taxation. We'll talk about tax revenue here in just a second. But the bottom line is I pay more in taxes at the retail side than I do at the medical side. And at the medical side, I can get two ounces. On the retail side, I'm only prohibited one. The drawback, though, is on the retail side, nobody's tracking the sale specific to a person. Since we started taxing this for lawful sales in our state, we look at a couple different products. The first one we look at is the edible products, anything that we can consume orally this way, all right? So this is the cookies, the candies, and things like this. Very popular because it offers a lot of alternatives and options for the folks that choose to use. It doesn't have the same stigma. Obviously, there's no odors to be concerned about, like, as you would with smoke, nothing visible as vaping, okay? But when you look at this, we can see the popularity. We, and in the first year, 4.8 million product units were sold. Last year, 11.8 product units were sold. And these come in various concentrations. We still sell and track raw flowering bud. We take a look at this in terms of pounds. We started off with 148,000 pounds. Last year, we were at 413,000 pounds. Year before that was even higher. And the thing to put this in perspective is we're talking about a half a million pounds of product that's sold and used in grams and ounces which gives you an idea. Once you step back and look at the numbers and what that means, you see the scope on it. The third area that they're tracking in the state of Colorado, and it's been in the last two years they put a specific emphasis on this, is the emerging issue of concentration. Concentrates have become the big issue. It provides a bigger bang for the buck. These are high potency THC content that you can smoke, consume, and you get a much longer and more sustainable high out of this. The one that is of most concern if you look in the top left hand where it says crumble and to the right of that where it says crystalline sugar, you're sometimes going to hear a crystal, you're sometimes going to hear a rock. Some people will actually refer to it as crack weed. It, all it is is a naturally occurring substance that's in the plant, THCA, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. The botanists have figured out how to extract that and isolate that as a standalone product, condense it down to a crystalline form, and market it to the general product. Potency levels of this product are being rated at 99.5% potency for THC. Now, there's, there's research out there to support the use of low-dose THC for therapeutic treatment of pain. I get that. We're talking like 3 5%. But at 99.5%, it leaves little doubt what the intention of that drug was. The bottom line is, is potency is driving profit, and the market demand by the consumers is for higher potency products and industries merely going along with them and producing those products for them. Retail sales from taxation, <clears throat> everyone wants to know about how much money is coming in. Well, last year we sold well over a billion dollars of product in our state. We look at taxable revenue coming in from the retail side, last year we were $240 million. When we look at the medical side, because this is where it all started, we noticed something a little more drastic. It's pretty flat. In fact, it's actually gone backwards. Where on the retail side, we've seen an increase of over 350%. On the medical side, there's actually been a very mild decrease in the amount of products sold under the guise of medical. A lot of this goes back to taxation. 
When we look at the taxation rate in Colorado, we're taxing it about 30%. That's before any local fees get added into it. With that kind of money, the premise being is that if we tax it, we regulate it, we can control it. You start hearing the argument, well, you're taxing it so high, you're driving people to the back market. So it, it's, you have to understand both sides of the issue. If we try to tax it and regulate it, there's going to be those that's going to argue that's going to send folks to it. But here's the problem with this. We can tell you how much was sold. I can tell you how much revenue we got in off of medical. I can tell you what we got in off of recreational. Like with any business model to determine the return on the investment, what do I have to know? I have to know what has it cost me to do business. What number we can't get? We can't get that first variable in the equation. Nobody is really tracking that information. What does it cost the state, the cities, the counties, the municipalities? What does it cost them to set up systems and programs to help monitor the industry that's in their jurisdictions? We've talked to economists about this, and they said the data's not there. First off, you're too new into this for only five years, and quite frankly, nobody really tracks that information. So again, it makes it hard for us to understand if we're ahead of the game of this. But here's the windfall taxation rate it is to the state of Colorado. Less than eight-tenths of one percent, roughly nine-tenths of one percent. That's it. That's the windfall. We were promised a huge cash cow that was going to come our way. Other states look at legalizing this for the exact same purpose. We've been doing this for five years now, and that's as good as it gets for us. I'm not, I'm not sure that was the, the best investment on this one for us. Everyone wants to talk about highway safety and public safety data, so let's, let's spend a little bit of time there since we're kind of cramped for time. When we look at accident rates, we have to understand something. And before I even go down this trail with you, please give me two seconds of undivided attention. I am not saying marijuana is causing these accidents. I am not saying marijuana is a fault for the fatal accidents we're going to talk about. What I am saying is this, though. Marijuana is becoming so prevalent in our driving community that as a public health and a public safety issue, we have to look at it. Is it a contributing cause to what the increases we are seeing? Okay? So, be, so we're all clear on that one. So the nice thing about this is now more people than just government are starting to look at these data. The Institute for uh, Insurance Highway Safety started looking at this. They did a survey from 2012, from 2016, and then a follow-up in 2017, where they looked at the marijuana states and the neighboring states that are not legalized, and they compared collision rates. And what they found overall is that the states that had gone legal had a higher accident rate than the states that had not gone legal. Over the four-year period as a whole, and even as the one-year period as a gap, the only exception to that one is our friends in, up in Oregon. They had a slight decline, but it, it's still about where it was. So it's relatively stable. When we look at the total accidents by year in Colorado, we've had an 18% increase. Now, again, I'm not saying marijuana causes this. Where our economy and our state is doing really, really well. People are flocking to our state. So we've got more people driving. Well, if we've got more people driving, the probability is there's going to be more accidents. But when we start looking at specific data and look at our fatality rates, we've seen some increases. And the correlation to when marijuana is legalized and some of the sidebar issues it causes us to take notice. This is the fatals that we've had by year. Anything in blue is pre-legalization, green is post-legalization. We've seen that we had a downward trend in our fatals prior to legalization, and then we see we had an upward trend since then. Of concern here is this. Overall, our fatal accident rate is up about 45% in Colorado. But when we pull the drivers that test positive in those accidents, just for the toxicology results where they test positive for marijuana, those rates have gone up by 157%. That caught our attention. When we started looking at the data as a whole, and again, when we look at data, you have to look at two things. You have to look at the raw number and the percentage that it represents. So when we look at the raw numbers, we see in 13 we had 71, in 19, or 2017 we had 162 drivers, died in accidents, tested positive. Does that seem like a lot of people? Some people would say no. I would say at what point is any one number a cutoff point for acceptable collateral threshold of damage? At what life? At what point is life worth? When we take a look at this number and compare it against all accidents, we see a jump on this thing. In 2010, about 10% of our drivers were testing positive for THC. By the time 2017 came along, we're up to 25%. Again, not saying marijuana is causing the accidents, but it's becoming a contributing factor that in public safety we have to look at. The presence of marijuana, especially marijuana and alcohol, are the two most leading polydrug issues that we deal with in criminal justice. It's that prevalent and that easy to get. So we started to look at use rates. Now the use, by the way, if, if you can see, that this, this is the state capital, our version of that beautiful building you've got right next door to you. This, this is on 420, it's become the party day in our town at 420 in the afternoon. Everyone gathers there and they have a smoking. 
You know, I had a presentation I did, and one guy said, well, are they allowed to smoke in public? No, they're not. I said, well, why didn't they arrest them? I said, where do you begin? It's like General Custer time. Where do you begin? You've got a couple hundred cops, and you have thousands upon thousands of people out there. So we started looking at use rates. We looked at 30 days, within the last 30 days, to find as current use rates. What we saw in our state is that our kids are that much higher. We're looking at 34, 35 percent than the national average. We have maintained the position in the top set, 10 position for the last few years. The good news is that that use rate, not only nationally, but also in Colorado, is going down. I mean, that, that's great news. We're happy to see that. It's also the number three age group seeking treatment for substance use disorders in our state. When we take a look at this age bracket for last 30-day use, on the far left, you have the U.S. rate, and then you have Alaska, Colorado, District of Columbia, Oregon, and Washington. We can see that over, since 2011, even prior to legalization, the national use rate for this age bracket's gone up. I'm sorry, down. When we look at the first states that went from medical to recreational, we see that their use rates by year are either at or substantially higher than the national average. When we looked at the non-marijuana states on this thing, their rates were at or below. We go to the next age bracket. This is the college kids. This is the largest cohort that we've got using in America right now. This, this 18 to 25 crew, they represent the highest use rates that we have nationally and also in our, our state. And we see that as a consistent pattern as we go from state to state. They're still about 58% higher than the national average, second leading group seeking treatment for substance use disorders in Colorado. And when we take a look at the national comparisons here, we see that nationally this age bracket has slowly been creeping up. But the same model that we look at, medical going to recreational states, use rates are at or substantially higher than the national average. Older folks, 26 and older, this is now the fastest growing group of people going to start to use. Whether they're reinitiating from because they haven't spoken in a long time or they're initiating for the first time, but this is what we're seeing. When you see a percentage change like 103%, be cautious when you see people throw data at you like that one. You have to know what the end value was. In this case, you have two relatively small numbers. And when there's a change between two relatively small numbers in value, the percentage change starts to look bigger. Okay? So it's a word of warning on these things. Number one age group seeking treatment. Not sure if it says, you know, I need to get my stuff together or there's just, it's causing enough problems. I need to do something. But they're moving on. But look at the upward trend that we're seeing nationally and in, in these marijuana states especially in the last few years. Interesting side note, geriatric folks, senior citizens, which I can now count myself as one, this is a next largest age group that's going in to start using this, okay? Again, accessibility, availability is there. The problem is where's this perception of harm and where's the, the point of initiation? We looked at 2017 information from SAMHSA for people 12 and older. What drug did you initiate with? You've got the list on your left. Here's what you've got. Alcohol was the first, marijuana was the second, and oddly enough, prescription pain medicine was the third illicit drug they started using. And that's, again, ages 12 and up when we look at this. Perception of harm, when they were given these drugs, everyone picked heroin as the one they're most afraid of because there's enough data and enough public conversation out there about the facts that people are dying from this. When they looked at this, they put heroin at the top of the list and marijuana was absolutely at the bottom of the list, more so than even alcohol or cigarettes. We take a look at that one. We started looking at emergency room data. I'm giving this to you as a partial information just so you have the warning behind it. We started looking at the data coming out as early as the early 2000s. What we had was reports coming out, this one out of Pittsburgh said, places that have more dispensaries have more hospitalizations related back to marijuana. Journal of American Medicine put one out in 14 and says, yeah, we're seeing increased patient admission related back to marijuana issues, but the level of psychosis that we're seeing is causing great concern. And they attributed the psychosis level to the THC concentrations that are currently available. People just don't know how to handle it. When we looked at actual data from Colorado from 11 to 14, we were, by the time that time period was done, we're sending about 50 people a day to an ER or ED somewhere in the state of Colorado. Now, take a look at data. You have to understand the gap on this thing. The medical industry was changing their billing coding system from ICD-9 to ICD-10 during the same time frame. There is no corresponding codes from ICD-9 to correspond to the new system of ICD-10. It took 16 and part of 17 to get through that. We're hoping by the time this year is done, we're going to start to be able to pull good data for the same billing codes now for admissions that are marijuana-related for 2018. So the reason I offer that to you, 
If you hear information about that people start talking about medical treatments and you hear those dates, be aware of that gap because it does impact the quality of information. It reduces the scope. A lot of the treatments that we're seeing in emergency rooms, little kids, it's the inadvertent exposures. They see it, they grab it, they eat the cookie, whatever it happens to be, just because we're not being cautious about how and responsible with the product we have in our house. The teens and tweens, not much there. The older folks, that's where they see the next jump. Either they're initiating for the first time or reinitiating, and they don't understand the potency levels. They start getting that high, the sweats, the tingles, they're not used to that level of high, and they don't know how to perceive it. The tachycardia sets in, they end up at the hospital, they think they're having a heart attack. No, nope, just too high, too fast. They don't know how to handle it. Some folks won't even go to the ER. The premise being is you cannot overdose on marijuana, which is, which is actually a fallacy. Why not just call the ER or call the Poison Control Center instead? So we take a look at data for legalization, not only for recreation, but moving forward. And we've seen a substantial increase in calls to the Poison Control Center, people reporting the marijuana being the proximate cause of the issues that they're having. And even when you break it down by age group, the 26 and older are still the group that we see the most frequent calls to, to poison control, and then the inadvertent exposures of the kids, where again, they get a hold of a piece of candy or a gummy or some type of lolly on that one, and that's where the exposures are coming from. When we take a look at the broad spectrum, and I know we're going fast on this, this is 30 minutes out of normally what's a two and four hour presentation that we do, but the key points are this, when we look at the marijuana relationship in our fatal accidents, we've seen it gone up. We've seen that the use rates for the 12 to 17 year olds in our state are going down, just as they are nationally, but we're still 34% higher than the national average. Our young adults are still sitting at 58% higher than the national average, and our older folks are coming in at a substantially higher rate of increase as well. When we take a look at perception of harm, the concern there is this, is that the misinformation that's out there around this drug the lack of good research and study that we have is leading to a perception that it is less harmful than cigarettes and alcohol, the two indicators that if we know in this country the, the, the cost to society that they bring, and now we think marijuana is, is, is safer than those. We look at ER, ED, and healthcare issues, we're seeing an increase on this one. And again, it goes back to availability. When we want some information, the problem that we ran into is where does the average person go? And we're trying to solve that. Again, we don't try to take a position pro or con one way or the other. We present data, let the data speak for itself, and then you make the determination of value out of that for yourself based on your own standings and beliefs. But to get some legitimate information, this is the website we have up and running. We just tore it down, refurbished it, and put it right back up again. The premise being is that if you're trying to get neutral information from an unbiased source, this is a resource that's there. Everything from written documents, reports from various agencies, training videos, that type, it, it, it's all there. Free to use, free to share, free to download. It's, it's there for you. And the offer I would make to this, this group is that if you have questions that come up later on, here's my contact information. Something that comes up, need to discuss, can you tell us facts about this, let's take a look. And I'll tell you, if it's something that I have, we'll get it to you. If not, we'll look it up together. With that, I'll yield my time, open it back up to the chairman. If you have any questions, we can specifically address those or move on. Thank you, Mr. Quigley. Uh, next will be... Uh listening to Senator Franzen uh, and presenting her bill. Uh, Senator Letts. Um, are we going to have an opportunity to ask Mr. Quigley a question or two? Or uh, We were hoping that after all testimony we would ask questions at that time. Okay. Well, then, then I won't ask him any specific questions right now, Mr. Chairman, but if, if it's possible for us to get a copy of his PowerPoint presentation. Well, um, that would be helpful. I don't see it in the packets unless my packet's missing something. Um, if he has any information regarding states other than Colorado and how they compare to the data that's been presented here about Colorado, that would be helpful. And I'd, I'd like to know exactly what the HIDTA is, if it's an independent organization, if it's an arm of the federal government, or exactly what it is. I'm not clear on that. Maybe I missed it earlier. But. Yeah. Mr. Quigley. Ours is different. We are not an enforcement issue. Ours simply is about sharing information. That's the 
that's the third tenant of the higher program. Somebody figured out who was here from Maine openly and had conversations. Mr. Quigley? Mr. Quigley, um, we usually don't have discussion on the side of the room. Uh, <laughs> if, if you would like to make those comments from the front table, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, Senator Latz, did you get an adequate answer, or should we have Mr. Quigley uh, go to the testifying table? I'm satisfied, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Latz. Senator Franzen, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And I want to start by thanking uh, the committee chair, Senator Limmer, for giving us an opportunity to present this topic. Certainly a topic of interest uh, to many uh, over the country as more and more states are grappling with whether to go down the path of legalization for recreational use of uh, cannabis. So uh, with that, i uh, like to begin um, with uh, testimony and pass it on to my co-author. Um, earlier this session, as you all know, we introduced Senate File 619 as a bipartisan bill that would legalize recreational cannabis for adults at least 21 years old. This legislation will, be further, uh, will further decriminalize and regulate cannabis use in Minnesota. The bill will primarily focus on the regulatory framework for responsible oversight of recreational use of cannabis. Back in 2013, Minnesotans and legislators embarked on the debate of whether we would uh, allow for medical cannabis use. And as policy members and members of the public, we participated in a month-long conversation about the merits of legalization of medical cannabis. While our emotions uh, ran high, a bipartisan consensus uh, created a carefully regulated system with safeguards to prevent abuse. As more states legalized cannabis for recreational use, most recently our Midwest neighbor, Michigan, Minnesota has thus far been reluctant to engage in the kind of serious conversations that happened five years ago until now. Senate File 619 is receiving its first hearing in this committee today, and I welcome a respectful conversation and debate to address the public concern and the challenges to implementation. Many have asked why I'm carrying this bill, and I answer because it's time to have this discussion, discussion excuse me, in Minnesota. Rare, rarely as a uh, legislation do we have the ability to have a win-win scenario, to tax a product where consumers agree should be taxed, and to regulate it to make it safer for consumers. We also have the ability to remove the need for the black market to exist, while eliminating the harm it has done to society with an expungement provision. I believe the state has both a public health and a safety interest in regulating and educating all Minnesotans on the risk of recreation use of cannabis. Prohibition has not worked thus far. Regulating cannabis and providing the necessary oversight and legal framework moving forward will reduce, not increase, the access to youth. Dr. Scott Jensen, my Republican co-author and sitting to my right uh, in this bill, and a physician in private practice acknowledged in our press conference earlier in this session, the cannabis may become legal, but it does not mean it's good for you. Senate File 619 seeks to, seeks to responsibly regulate and address all aspects of cannabis use by prohibiting the use to sale to minors under 21, uphold current law prohibiting impaired driving, uphold the Clean Indoor Air Act, protect employers' rights to keep the workplace safe, and protect landlords' rights to prevent smoking on their property. It also will keep local control to regulate the production and sale in local communities. It will establish rules on the operation of dispensaries, and it will develop a tracking system seed to sale. And the revenue from taxation will be used to address mental health services, training for police, and public health education for teens about the potential health consequences of cannabis use. We will fund research on mental health impacts and risk factors for addiction and study the effects of cannabis related to potency levels and dosage for safe driving. Finally, we will decriminalize and expunge past nonviolent offenses. I want to encourage, again, a respectful dialogue as we continue to discuss the merits of legalizing the adult recreational use of cannabis, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Franzen, for bringing this bill forward. I don't think I'll readily forget the day that uh, Senator Rest and Senator Franzen came and asked me to participate in this bill. I probably didn't quite realize exactly uh, what we're going to get into. But for me, uh, the issue was uh, basically there was a perfect storm. In uh, November, two uh, political groups uh, achieved major political party status in Minnesota, both uh, on the issue of marijuana. Uh, Michigan approved it. 
uh, in December, the federal agricultural bill approved uh, hemp, and then the uh, other one would be the CBD. We're seeing CBD products uh, sold at pharmacies and grocery stores. So it became clear that we needed to start understanding the, the issue uh, before us. I think in 2013, opening the doors to medical marijuana was a huge deal. Over the last uh, two years, four additional diagnoses are now medically eligible, including PTSD, the autism spectrum, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and dementia. Well, just those two last ones, obstructive sleep apnea and dementia, are exceedingly common. And as the population grows older, we're not going to see less dementia. We're going to see more. And obstructive sleep apnea, I could editorialize on, uh, but I'll just say this. It's a very common disorder. And generally, when the workup is initiated, usually the diagnosis is made. Personally, in the office, I have seen uh, young people come in uh, having been sexually abused because uh, they thought they were participating in maybe a trivial brownie at, at a party and uh, with no awareness on their part, uh, Rohypnol had been laced into the product. And so they indeed were, uh, if you will, uh, candidates um, or at risk for being sexually abused, and they were. I've seen 60-year-old uh, patients come in with uh, mental health issues of anxiety, stress, and uh, insomnia, and a half of a gummy bear an hour before they go to bed has changed their lives. I've seen Opiate studies indicate that uh, when THC is used as an alternate, 25% of the people on opiates have been able to get off the opiates. I see alcohol deaths far more uh, problematic than I see any other uh, drug. So to me, it, it harkens back to the way we've talked about fireworks in uh, this state. We've often focused our, our thoughts on sales and commercialization, possession, and then use. And I, I'm not advocating, and I don't support legalization of recreational marijuana at this point in time. But as Senator Franson told me right out of the get-go, she said, it's time to have the discussion. And for that, I, I really appreciate uh, the respect to this topic that Senator Limmer and uh, his colleagues have given to it today. So thank you again. But I do think that we need to talk about decriminalizing, uh, if you will, uh, trivial amounts of marijuana. I don't think that we can really know how this issue has affected communities of color, uh, communities of uh, minorities, community of immigrants. And so f for me, uh, I'm absolutely interested in that discussion. Lastly, I think Senator Franzen's bill really puts a bright light on the issue of impairment, safety, regulation. And I think in fairness to Senator Franzen, I think everybody should realize that nowhere along the line has the issue been Maybe we can acquire some tax dollars. That's not part of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jensen. Uh, now, uh, despite uh, comments by Senator Jensen, we will now give proponents 30 minutes to give testimony for the bill and then 30 minutes to those that oppose. Uh, Senator Franzen, uh, do you have uh, an author's amendment that you were wanting to propose? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do. I have an author's amendment, the A-9, All right. just to I, put the bill in the shape we want it. I believe the A-9 amendment is in our members' packets. Senator Pappas moves the A-9 amendment. This is an author's amendment. Uh, for those in the audience, uh, this gives an author uh, a last-minute chance to put a bill in their as perfect a form as they can before a committee. So we do not debate the merits of an author's amendment. We simply pass it to get it in the form that the author wishes it to be in before we consider it. Uh, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of the A9 author's amendment say yes. Opposed? The, the amendment prevails. Thank you. Senator uh, Franzen. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. I think we're going to start with the testimony from proponents. All right. I'm with Dr. Carter Casimir. Dr. Casimir. And before we begin, I just wanted to uh, state one thing again. To respect everyone's time and to be as fair as possible, each side has been given 30 minutes. So we will... Uh, those of you who may be next, and I'll, I'll make mention Marcus Harkus and Ben Feist will be up next. And so if you want to make your way up to the front, we can save uh, the proponent's time. Uh, Dr. Kazmir. 
Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the members of this committee for taking up this very important matter of the legalization of cannabis. My name is Carter Kasmer. I live in Minneapolis, and I'm a physician specializing in emergency medicine. On a daily basis, I care for acutely ill and injured patients, and I've done so in many of our region's largest, busiest trauma centers and referral centers. The nature of our work demands that we are experts in recognizing and treating medical emergencies and that we hold at the ready a deep, reflexive knowledge of the illnesses that can truly pose a threat to our patients' lives. You may be asking yourself, what do these physicians think of the threat posed to the community by cannabis use? And the short answer, the true answer, is that we don't. We don't have time to worry about patients ingesting a plant that poses no actual toxicity and which, to reassure Mr. Quigley, cannot be taken in overdose. We are far too busy caring for patients suffering from the acute effects, accidents, injuries, and myriad chronic illnesses that accompany the use of legal, widely abused drugs such as alcohol and tobacco. We are far too busy caring for patients addicted to opiates who come to us needing resuscitation from an overdose. I have never treated a cannabis overdose, and I simply never will. Under federal law, cannabis remains classified as Schedule I. In the eyes of the federal government, this means that cannabis is seen as equally dangerous as heroin and more dangerous than cocaine, methamphetamine, prescription opiates, and prescription sedatives. To anyone in the medical community, the error in this classification is glaring and immediate, and the credibility of those who truly believe this to be true is called into question. Our most vulnerable patient's health is often complicated by barriers to housing and employment posed by prior convictions for nonviolent crimes, including possession of cannabis. Consider the many ways the communities you serve, particularly minority communities and people of color, are harmed by a poorly informed status quo that makes criminals out of tens of thousands of otherwise law-abiding citizens. Cannabis prohibition has failed. I come to you as a proud Minnesotan and a medical professional asking that you abandon the fear and the ignorance that associated with cannabis prohibition and help us all into a better future for the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Marcus Harkis. Okay. And Ben Feist to follow. And after uh, Ben Feist, Jason Tarasik. Uh, Mr. Harkins. Good afternoon, Senators. Good afternoon, Minnesota. My name is Marcus Harkins. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Campaign for Full Legalization. We're a nonprofit cannabis legalization advocacy organization with the mission to end marijuana prohibition to establish a fully legalized adult personal use cannabis industry, home growing rights, and to repair the victims of unjust prohibition laws. Prohibition is the problem, it's not cannabis. We're here today representing more than half a million adult Minnesotan cannabis consumers and the nearly 10,000 Minnesotans arrested and countless thousands harassed each year over this healing plant. This morning, I myself smoked some high-grade, high-potency cannabis. And not only am I still alive, but I'm thriving partially because of it. I'm a responsible, peaceful 40-year-old family man, writer, organizer, social entrepreneur, and social justice warrior from North Minneapolis. I began smoking cannabis almost daily since I was 20 years old for personal, spiritual, and social use because it's good for relaxation. It helps relieve pain, physical, mental, and emotional, and it helps people sleep well. Cannabis also en enhances my enjoyment of many positive life experiences, and having fun should not be illegal if you're harming no one. As a young black man, I've been pulled over 65 times in my life. I'm 40 years old. And 50 of these incidents were due to racial profiling, most of, the, of it occurring in my teens and 20s. Cannabis has helped me to overcome post-traumatic stress from experiencing this excessive racial profiling here in Minnesota. And a couple incidents of police brutality, including one incident where a, a woman friend and I were caught smoking by the Mississippi River by a U of M cop who detained me and sadistically searched my vehicle and my person for nearly two hours, verbally, emotionally abusing me, and sexually assaulting me by repeatedly grabbing my crotch. You know, this senseless, humiliating violation of my human rights traumatized me, and it represents an example of how police commonly use prohibition as a tool to waste law enforcement resources, harassing and criminalizing people who are not posing any public safety threats. If you please allow me to finish, I just have like 90 seconds, two minutes. Uh well, I'll, I'll warn you to finish it up quickly. All right, we, please. We've got a lot of people. I've, I've been, you, this is Marcus. the people's house. We represent half a million people, who most of them are afraid to talk to you. Cannabis is a healing plant. It's not a crime. 
Contrary to the anti-legalization propaganda you've heard, cannabis is not a dangerous killer drug, nor is it a so-called gateway drug. The federal government has been lying about cannabis since prohibition was enacted in 37, and they've been lying even more since, they, since the Richard Nixon created the Controlled Substance Act in 71. We're not here to defend cannabis because any intelligent adult who wants to know can easily learn that cannabis is a natural alternative medicine that human beings have used for thousands of years without a single fatal overdose. In fact, the most dangerous thing about cannabis is getting caught with it by the police because you can lose your freedom, you can lose your job, you can lose your housing, you can lose your children and worse. Philando Castile was killed by a cop because he smelled like cannabis even though he was doing nothing wrong except driving while black, which also needs to be legalized. Most cannabis consumers live in fear of being criminalized because of cannabis prohibition. And this fear over a nonviolent, victimless farce of a so-called crime is oppressive. Prohibition is oppressive. We're here today to ask you to end these unjust prohibition laws, to set aside your personal bias, to overcome your cognitive dissonance, to stop being willfully ignorant, if that applies to you, and to join us in standing on the right side of history. You don't have to be pro-cannabis to be opposed to its failed prohibition. Mr. Harkis, you're going to have to end it. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have to scratch okay. off people that are proponents. I understand that. I, Please. I, there's just a lot of people counting on this. I'm uh, yeah, but you're now up to almost four minutes. And you okay. Given well, two. I, I just want to I was, I just wanna close with this. Each one of you are 201 people with the power to end these unjust laws. And you, there's half a million people and more counting on you to do that now. We don't want to wait to live free. Prohibition is the problem, and it's not cannabis. Full legalization is the only solution. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Argus. Mr. Feist, followed by Mr. Tarasik. Sorry Tarasik. about that. Mr. Feist. Mr. Chair, members of the committee. This is my Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ben Feist, I'm the Legislative Director with the ACLU of Minnesota. The ACLU of Minnesota supports the legalization of marijuana through a system of taxation, licensing, and regulation. The history of criminalization of this drug has had a staggeringly disproportionate impact on African Americans and other communities of color and comes at a tremendous human and financial cost. Arrests and convictions for possessing marijuana can negatively impact public housing, student financial aid eligibility, employment opportunities, child custody determinations, and immigration status. A 2013 report from the National ACLU found that blacks are almost eight times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana possession in Minnesota, even though data shows that the use rates between blacks and whites are very similar. This was the third highest disparity in the nation. The disparities are even larger in Minneapolis, where our 2014 report found that blacks were 11 times more likely than whites to be arrested for possession. Since so many people have been swept up in the criminalization of marijuana over the years, the expungement provisions of this bill are extremely important and should be expanded as it, as it moves forward. We understand that getting to the right regulation in Minnesota will take a lot of hard work and input from many diverse stakeholders. Thank you for hearing the bill today. Thank you, Mr. Feist. Mr. Tarasik, uh, followed by uh, Lili Fatihi. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing all of those correctly. Some challenging names this afternoon. Mr. Mr. Tarasik. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Jason Tarasik. I am a lawyer with an office in Edina. That's okay. My name's been mispronounced my whole life. I could take it. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, that's all right. Um, I am the Minnesota political director for a group called the Marijuana Policy Project or MPP. MPP has been instrumental in helping with legalization campaigns throughout the country. Uh, MPP is not necessarily pro-marijuana. MPP is anti-prohibition. We believe prohibition has failed. And we believe it's time for Minnesota to accept that reality and perhaps consider that we should stop allowing criminals to profit from selling marijuana. We believe it is time to regulate and tax marijuana for adult use in Minnesota. After all, right now, we believe, we expect rather, it will be roughly a $1 billion industry when legalized. We estimate that that may generate $300 million to $400 million in tax revenue that could be used to help Minnesota. And right now, we're letting that go into the criminals' pockets. 
We recognize the primary concerns of the prohibitionists, impaired driving and teen use. We share those concerns. But the reality is impaired driving is happening now. Teen use is happening now. In fact, what we have seen is that, and I believe Mr. Quigley confirmed this earlier, teen use goes down after you legalize. And impaired driving, that's just a reality now. And to my knowledge, a field sobriety test does not discriminate according to what you're impaired by. You are impaired by cannabis, you are impaired by alcohol, a field sobriety test will indicate whether you're impaired. We hear that there is no breathalyzer equivalent for marijuana, that's true, but we believe the increased tax revenue can be dedicated to enhance police enforcement to lower impaired driving. I'm mindful of my time, I wish I had more, but I'll, I'll leave it with this. We believe Minnesota is ready for adult use marijuana. Uh, we ask for you to allow Minnesotans to, to make the safer choice compared to alcohol. We ask you to vote yes on Senate file 619. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next would be uh, Ms. Fahy. Fahy, thank you. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Laylee Fadahi, and I am the campaign manager for Minnesotans for Responsible Marijuana Regulation. We are a statewide, multi-partisan coalition and campaign that supports the legalization and responsible regulation of marijuana for safe adult recreational use in Minnesota. Murmur's members and supporters include former state legislators from both the Republican and DFL parties, medical doctors, indigenous community leaders, organized labor, civil society organizations like the NAACP, ACLU, National Council of Jewish Women, and others, and a growing list of mayors and city council members from across the state, ranging from Minneapolis to Red Wing to Fergus Falls and many places in between. Our ranks include people the likes of whom you've probably never anticipated would show up in a room like this advocating for legalization. People who you would not find burning one down at Mr. Quigley's 420 rally, and yet here they are today. And why is that? Because perhaps the biggest untruth Mr. Quigley spoke today is that people's minds are made up and they don't care about the facts, so you should feel free to ignore them. We've been reaching out to communities and organizations, affinity groups, and policymakers of all different persuasions from all corners of Minnesota. And what we have found is that Minnesotans from all walks of life are questioning what they've been told are the quote unquote facts about the dangers of marijuana and the necessity of prohibition. And they're questioning those facts because they don't align with the truth. They're questioning why we're spending billions of dollars on a system of prohibition that is utterly failing to keep people from using marijuana, including children. They're wondering why the top interest groups that are spending money to oppose legalization are the alcohol industry, the private prisons, and the pharmaceutical industry. They're one, and after today, they're going to be wondering why they heard a supposedly neutral, non-biased, purely evidence-based testimony from a source that has been widely discredited by experts for presenting misleading conclusions and incomplete data to the exclusion of rigorous peer-reviewed research that shows no increase in vehicle fatalities, a drop in adolescent marijuana use, and an average drop of 23% in opio opioid deaths in states that have legalized marijuana final two sentences. Still many other Minnesotans are thinking about how given rapidly changing public opinions in support of legalization, that legalization is inevitable in Minnesota, and that if it's going to happen, we should make sure it happens in a way that benefits rather than excludes Minnesota's farmers, keeps our children safe from being advertised or sold cannabis products, and that maintains the safety of our roads and redresses the disproportionate impacts that marijuana prohibition has had on people and communities of color. Minnesota is ready to talk meaningfully and truthfully about legalization. We hope you're ready as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Marin Schroeder, followed by Chris Hallbrook. Thank you. You did really close. Uh, my name is Marin Schroeder. Marin. <laughs> I have an off day today. Sorry about That's, that. You know what? Everyone does it to me, actually. Thank um, you. I'm president of Sensible Minnesota. We're an education advocacy-based nonprofit with a mission to make our neighborhoods safer and more inclusive for those negatively impacted by cannabis prohibition and the war on drugs. 
Um, my testimony today, the scope of it is I'm going to talk about medical cannabis. So I'll just disclose that we've worked with about 500 patients one on one and worked with, talked with thousands of patients over the past four years. Our opponents to legalization here today will say Minnesota has decriminalized marijuana and legalized its medical use. Yet we're still arresting nearly 10,000 Minnesotans each year for marijuana, over half for possession at increasing rates since medical cannabis legalization. Uh, clearance rates, crime solved, for violent crimes is only 46%, but when it comes to drug crimes, they clear 85%. Medical cannabis is not accessible or affordable. We have low patient numbers and products costing up to four times their equivalent in other states. As of last Friday, there were 15,416 patients enrolled in the program. In comparison, New York and Pennsylvania, who both worked from our model, have about 100,000 patients each, adjusted for population that's nearly 30 and 40,000 patients respectively. If we had a true patient access model like Arizona, we would have over 150,000 patients in this state protected from law enforcement interference with their health care. Opponents to this bill are the same opponents who helped construct our failed medical cannabis program, one that prevents patient access, doesn't provide it. The same opponents have yet to offer solutions to improve access and affordability for the over 130,000 patients not served by our current program. There are many reasons to legalize cannabis for adult use, and Minnesota is ready. But our organization is focused on patient access. It's personal for us. We're a team of patients, caregivers, and parents of patients. Unfortunately, we're left with what we have today. The best option to truly provide that access to those 130,000 patients is to urgently fully legalize cannabis in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Marin. Uh, next is uh, Xavier Baikot. Uh, Chris Holbrook first. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris Holbrook. <laughs> and then and it's Xavier Bickett. is, if Xavier is in the room, you can come forward. Mr. Holbrook. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Holbrook. I'm the chair of the Libertarian Party of Minnesota. Libertarians support social understanding, financial responsibility, peace, and free markets made up of voluntary transactions. We have 10 city council members elected throughout the state representing 205,000 residents. The Libertarian Party of Minnesota calls for a full repeal of marijuana prohibition. As we have since our founding 48 years ago, the same year President Nixon declared the war on drugs, which is ineffective, unfair, and immoral. It started as a prohibition law in 1937 to protect corporate greed with government power and turned into a tool for racist political ambitions, admitted to by the Nixon administration. Just last year, the Minneapolis Police Department was caught targeting minorities in a low-level marijuana sting operation where 46 of 47 arrested were black men. The Libertarian Party supports legalization, but we oppose the provision that requires a permit to grow plants at home for personal use, as well as limiting that to four home plants. Truth be told, that is simply a permit to continue racism, sanctioned warrantless raids of private property, and justification of government force. That is unfair to both citizens and police. No effect of cannabis can be as harmful as doing jail time for using it. Lives are ruined in prison. America has an industrial prison complex holding 25% of the world's incarcerated people, with beneficiaries being prison owners and their unions. Mexican drug cartels get 60% of their funds from marijuana. Criminalization creates violence. The Libertarian Party also supports expungement. There are hundreds of people in jail in Minnesota for marijuana offenses. One of them is Steve Yang, serving a 74-month sentence for trying to buy and sell 250 pounds of marijuana to make a bunch of money to take care of his disabled family. In Minnesota, they give him a long sentence for that. In the state of Washington, they'd give him a business license. The financial losses are obvious in Minnesota. We waste $2 million a year fighting marijuana activity, while in the 11 states that have legal recreational, they average $2 million of tax profit per week. Libertarian Party of Minnesota supports legalization, but we oppose taxation in general and strongly oppose the excessive 37% suggested in this bill. Cannabis should be taxed and regulated like anything else in your garden. It is immoral for the government to dictate what a private individual may grow and consume on his own land. We demand full legalization with no strings attached to start fixing the problems that government has created. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bicot, am I pronouncing Oh, that? my apologies. I thought you had asked for Javier. Uh, I'm not Xavier. Oh, Xavier. Xavier. I, I am on the list. I can go ahead and, and speak if you'd like. Um, why don't we hold you off okay. until we, we've got to go on the order. Uh, is there a Xavier Bicot in the room? 
Guess not. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Gunnar Oz, followed by Matthew Kaiser. Javier, uh, I don't have you on the list. Were you on the list? Oh, I see. Yeah, just stay up on the front and we'll get you next. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Oz. All right, uh, thank you for the opportunity to test testify before you today. Uh, my name is Gunnar Ose and I'm a campus organizer with Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Uh, we are an international student movement working to end the war on drugs. I'm here today to encourage you to support uh, Senate File 619, which would regulate the cultivation, production, sale, and consumption of cannabis products in Minnesota. Um, I want to share a short story with you that um, you know, is about a friend of mine and many other young Minnesotans. Um, so in 2014, during my junior year of high school, a very close friend of mine started selling small amounts of weed in order to bring in some extra spending money you know, without having to work a menial uh, fast food part-time job. Um, his business was super juvenile, harmless, mostly borrowing his parents' car in order to sell $20 of flowers um, to classmates and such. Um, you know, his profits weren't great. He subsidized his own use, but one day when he had the option to make about $100, he jumped right on it. Um, and everything about that day seemed very normal. They met in a parking lot, um, you know, traded the baggie, um, but instead of getting money, he got a gun pointed in his face. Um, you know, he took the weed, all the money, his wallet, his cell phone, and left. Um, and my friend is there, stunned, traumatized, and the savings gone, and he couldn't do anything. He couldn't go to the police. He couldn't even tell his parents. Um, his only options were to retaliate and continue a cycle of violence, or to write it off as a loss um, and call it a night. Thankfully, he chose the latter, but there, there are a lot of folks who, who don't. Um, and this is what really started getting me thinking about the war on drugs and doing my work as an activist. Um, so in a, few, in a few minutes here, you'll be hearing from speakers who somehow see our laws, our un unregulated markets, and all the harms that come from prohibition and think this is okay. I have never, from the other side, um, heard an alternative solution to these problems caused by prohibition. So I hope they answer that today of, if not this, then what? Um, Minnesota and Minnesotans cannot afford inaction, and we deserve better. Um, for those reasons, I urge you to make this happen this year. Thank you, Mr. Oz. Uh, Javier, we're going to skip over and then followed up by Matthew Kaiser. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, good afternoon, Senators. Thank you for having me today. I've shortened my, my statement just a bit to try to respect everyone's time. Uh, my name is Javier Arnado. I'm a licensed attorney in Minnesota. And prior to moving here, I worked in sales and compliance uh, for a commercial cannabis company in Denver, Colorado. It was one of the most awe-inspiring uh, times in my life and to be able to work with such bright minds and to witness democracy and liberty at work. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Campaign for Full Legalization to advocate for ending cannabis prohibition. Legalizing cannabis will serve the state of Minnesota in promoting social justice and establishing the regulatory framework to have a safe market for consumer access. Uh, to the social justice point, uh, many have spoken before, but I'll just say there is no place for this in a free society. The current enforcement model is institutionalizing racism by disproportionately impacting minority populations for nonviolent behavior. That poses little societal risk. The effect, this affects tens of thousands of Minnesotans. There is no place for this, and legalization will lead to an equitable reformation of our criminal justice system and a more effective use of police resources. To the consumer access point, currently the most dangerous thing about cannabis is purchasing cannabis. Unregulated sales create a market with easy access for those under 21. It promotes exposure to illicit substances and violence, as well as tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of tax, do of, of tax revenue not being realized. Legalizing and regulating cannabis will allow for a market that ensures consumer safety, reduces minors' access to cannabis, and creates a boon of tax revenue for the state of Minnesota. This is not a novel premise. 11 states have legalized. 22 have a medical model. Not a single one has repealed. California did this in 1994. That's 25 years this has been happening, and not a single one has, has repealed. Legal access is supported by the majority of Minnesotans. States like California are pioneering reformation of criminal justice system and war on drugs. Colorado has raised over $200 million in cannabis tax revenue since 2014 for a statewide school construction project. There's also been no increase 
in average annual traffic fatalities. In fact, the percentage of traffic fatalities that can actually be attributed to cannabis impairment dropped 33% from 2016 to 2017. There is no evidence to show that cannabis legalization has created a less safe environment in Colorado. The people of the state want legal access to cannabis and the time is now. Cannabis legislation is closer to panacea than pandemic and a shift from criminalization to commercialization should reflect that. Prohibition is the problem not cannabis. Full legalization is the only solution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kaiser. I thank you, committee chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Matthew Kaiser, and I'm here not only speaking for myself, but the thousands of Minnesotans who are afraid to speak up out of fear of being prosecuted. I speak as a medical cannabis patient who for years unknowingly medicated, and instead of being called a patient, was labeled a criminal. That's because the healing aspects of cannabis are just now being fully realized. The fact is that there are more health benefits than what is being narrowly defined as medical use. Many, if not most, cannabis users like myself are or were inadvertently or unknowingly treating an illness or ailment. Unfortunately, two minutes is an inadequate amount of time to really hear our stories. But what it comes down to is this. I work hard. I work overnight, 10 hours a day, six days a week. I work overnights because I have another full-time job. I make doctor's appointments, keep them, specialists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and caseworkers. When I come home after work and I want to unwind, I don't want a beer. And I don't judge my friends or my neighbors for their desire to do so. What I want when I get home from work, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, is a joint. When I'm tired and sore, when my hands hurt and my head aches, what I want is to smoke a little bit, take a shower, and go to sleep. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's absolutely no reason to be criminalized over it anymore. Prohibition has not worked. We're at war with our family and our friends and our neighbors. It's time for our politicians to stop throwing stones. My life has been enriched because of this plant, but could at any time be destroyed due to its criminality? It's sad that the worst part about, being, about cannabis is being caught with it. It's time to create a safe and regulated market and end this failed prohibition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaiser. Uh, Jason Brom, followed by Sarah Wellington. Thank you, everybody in the committee for Mr. Brown, let, yep. please proceed. Thank you all for letting me speak today. Hello, my name is Jason Barham. I'm from Winona. I almost lost my life 10 years ago when I, when I became highly addicted to an anxiety medicine called Klonopin. I had extreme withdrawals from it, and it wasn't for my family and my wife I would have lost my life. Marijuana never gave me any of these side effects, and it's been 10 years now since taking any pills. I'm here today to talk about my feelings towards a possible bill that would end prohibition cannabis in Minnesota. In Minnesota, we have many great minds. A lot of these minds agree that cannabis is not the problem. Prohibition is. We need to come together. We need your great minds and our beautiful capital to make this mission to end prohibition a reality. Here in Minnesota, we sit in a great position. We have other states that look at the pros and cons. We have an opportunity here to help so many. It could, it could provide money for education, help underfunded schools that have technology programs, science programs, grants, and most importantly, upgrades to current schools to build new schools. We can't, keep, we can't keep living life with fear and assuming things anymore. Look at the mistakes we've seen in the last 100 years that affected millions of people's lives, especially in America where we consider to have the best way of life with our freedoms. We as Americans have been persuaded by our peers that push this fear into us so that their views can continue to live. We cannot let fear dictate what we do in life. If we continue to let it direct us, we in fact keep giving fear a platform to continue to succeed. We've also heard many stories about our brave men and women coming back from serving our country with PTSD, many, many of these with other disabilities. CBD helps them mentally while THC helps treat the pain, but PTSD is just not a wartime illness. It's around us more than people think. A good friend of mine is diagnosed with PTSD as he was sexually and physically abused when he was a kid. Again, CBD helps him mentally, whereas pharmaceuticals had him on the edge of suicide. THC would help calm these awful outbreaks of painful emotional stress. Cannabis has many stories like this where it provides health and wellness to so many. I ask you not 
to be afraid to step out of line. Make your own line. This is what great leaders do. Sometimes you have to start something new. It might be bold, but it's the right thing to do. Don't let fear hold you back. We can make more businesses. We can make more jobs. We can make more funds for our schools in our beautiful state of Minnesota. We showed America how to not make a medical bill, but we, we have a chance here to turn this around, to show America how to make a full legalization bill. Thank you for your time. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wellington. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Wellington. I'm a mom, a St. Paul resident, a wife, a St. Paul school English teacher, a Minnesota cannabis patient, and a consumer member on the task force on medical cannabis therapeutic research, and a person living with MS. As a teacher, I thought it was most appropriate to start with a book. So I read to you today from It's, a, it's Just a Plant by Ricardo Cortez. One day, a government decided to make a law against marijuana, continued the officer. The government started a war around the world to stop people from growing it. Marijuana became an illegal plant. Do doctors tried to protest the new law, but the politicians and lawmakers did not listen. Jackie couldn't believe it. Mommy, she said, is that all true? It is true, said Jackie's mother. Any government can make a bad law, she said. Luckily, where we live, people can work together, together to fix unfair laws. We are here to fix the unfair laws of cannabis prohibition. The high moral, criminal, social, and economic costs of prohibition are robbing me and so many others of their health, happiness, and freedom. Cannabis is a safer path towards health that opiates, benzodiazepines, muscle relaxants, and all the rest of big pharma cannot offer. Me and millions of other people Prohibitionists are more dangerous than cannabis. Prohibition is the problem, not cannabis. Full legalization is the only way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wellington. Uh, last two individuals will be Brett Buckner and Katie Cummins Baco. Is Brett Buckner in the room? And is Katie Cummins Baco? There she is. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. My name is Katie Cummins Baco, and I'm here to testify that cannabis is an exit drug. I have a disabling genetic collagen disease that comes with nerve bone, joint, and vascular problems. I've had over 25 surgeries in my life. My first was at age seven, and my next is for tethered spinal cord on April 4th. From 2014 through 2016, I had at least 14 of those surgeries. Three spinal fusions, both hips replaced, and more. Each time I was prescribed OxyContin and OxyCodone. Each time, my dose was increased. By 2016, I was taking about 200 milligrams of oxys a day. Though I was being managed at a pain clinic, I wasn't living. I was merely existing. In a rare moment of clarity, I realized I would die if I stayed on this path. Between my own determination and this amazing plant, I was able to wean off cannabis when I became certified in 2016. I could not have done it without cannabis as an exit drug. Now I'm able to use cannabis as my daily maintenance medication for chronic pain. When I do have surgeries, I use OxyContin as it should be used, just for short term. I'm often given more pain meds, the OxyContin, than I even need, and I go back to cannabis much earlier than the doctors think I could be able to. The other night, I accidentally took two doses of my pain meds, <coughs> cannabis. Brain fog is common with chronic illness. The repercussion was that I forgot to brush my teeth. Had that happened in 2014, my husband would have been calling for an ambulance for Narcan. Please seriously consider this bill and that cannabis saves lives, including my own. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to the uh, opponent's testimony, and we'll begin with uh, Kim Bemis, followed by Teresa Lunt.
Mr. Bemis, welcome to the committee. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, all senators, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Kim Bemis, and I am the chair of the Local Action Committee for Smart Approaches to Marijuana, called SAM, and we are called SAMIN. SAM is working extensively throughout the country to promote science and understanding of the harms of marijuana, especially related to commercialization and normalization. Our public health position is that the current science does not support the commercialization and normalization of recreational marijuana. I approach this issue from both a personal and professional viewpoint. I am a person in long-term recovery, which means for me that I have not used marijuana since August 13, 1988. Pot was my drug of choice, and I am an example that marijuana is an addictive substance. In short, marijuana ruined my life. I also approach this from a professional standpoint in that I have designed and run an online drug and alcohol intervention program for teens and their families called Gobi Support. Inquiries to my program run about 90% from parents concerned because their teens are using marijuana. The good news in the recent National Institute of Health survey is that marijuana use is down overall, but the devil is in the details because in states where it is legal, they also have the highest rate of teen use than other states. Legalization leads to increased access. Unfortunately, marijuana is not the harmless plant that many people describe it as. Marijuana particularly affects the prefrontal cortex part of the developing brain, which is the part of the brain that affects decision making and is therefore the most important part to develop in teens. Judith Greisel, in her book, Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction, said, so the changes in behavior that happen during adolescence are so important and lasting because the brain is forming permanent structures. So when the circuits are being laid down, if they're laid down under the influence of a, of a drug, then they're going to be laid down differently than if it's not under the influence of a drug. Recent research from Canada that was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry tracked 3,800 teens over four years showed marijuana users had significant cognitive impairment functioning as opposed to those that used alcohol. And there is now credible evidence that for families with a history of mental health issues, that marijuana use by teens can hasten the onset of psychotic events like depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar. In closing, decriminalization and improvements to the medical marijuana law can happen without commercialization. This is a very complicated subject. Minnesota does not need to be the 12th state to do so. Eight others have rejected. We urge the state to wait and see and let others figure out the best way to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bemis. Uh, Teresa Lunt, Lunt uh, followed by Edward Ellinger. Dr. Ellinger. Ms. Lunt. Mr. Chair and committee members, I'm Teresa Lunt, a parent, retired Osseo Area Schools board member, and a member of Partnership for Change. Our coalition was created 11 years ago to reduce alcohol and drug use among youth and young adults in Northwest Hennepin County. We've been working hard to implement environmental strategies that are proven to reduce youth drug use. We've seen a downturn in youth use of alcohol and tobacco products, but just when progress is being made, the 2016 Minnesota Student Survey shows youth perception of harm relating to marijuana is on the decline. Most notably, only 55% of ninth graders believe marijuana is a risky substance. Youth are now turning to marijuana and e-cigarettes as their drugs of choice. Case in point, just last week, six students at Cambridge Isanti High School required medical attention after vaping marijuana and becoming ill. Our school resource officers say students are increasingly vaping marijuana and it's difficult to detect due to the vapor being odorless and smokeless. Marijuana is addictive and harmful to the human brain. Marijuana and the concentrates on the market now can contain up to 99% THC, far from the 3 to 5% THC of the 60s and 70s weed. 9% of marijuana users will become dependent. If use starts in adolescence, that increases to 17%, almost one in five children. Regular marijuana use can present a higher risk of reducing IQ points by up to eight, we know the human brain is still developing well into the late 20s. Youth marijuana use continues to rise in states that have legalized, 
Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and D.C. have seen past month use of marijuana among 12 to 17 year olds continuing to rise above the national average. Alaska and Oregon are leading the nation in past year marijuana use among 12 to 17 year olds. And Colorado holds the top ranking for first time marijuana use among youth, a 65% increase in the years since legalization. Colorado toxicology reports show the percentage of adolescent suicide victims testing positive for marijuana have increased. In Anchorage, Alaska, school suspensions for marijuana use and possession increased more than 141% from 2015 when legalization was implemented to 2017. Legislators say we can do this right and learn from the mistakes of legalized states. Make no mistake. Regulated markets only increase exposure and promote the normalization of youth marijuana use. The more available a drug is, the more youth use. As Mr. Quigley reported, Colorado, Colorado has more marijuana dispensaries than Starbucks and McDonald's combined. It is sad commentary when it's easier for our youth in Colorado to access marijuana, find marijuana, than a tall dark roast or a Big Mac. So I've included this graphic in, your test, in my testimony you should have in your packet. This is telling. Even though Colorado has legalized recreational marijuana, the majority of municipalities in the state have banned dispensaries in their jurisdictions noted by the green-colored counties. Communities do not want pot in their neighborhoods. Please consider the research and data and do not pass along Senate File 619. A more drugged society and the social shrapnel legalized marijuana leaves in its wake does not benefit anyone in our communities. Our youth and the citizens of our state deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ellinger, followed by Dr. Ken Winters. Mr. Ellinger. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Edward Ellinger, a board-certified internist and pediatrician. Previously, I was the, the director of Boynton Health Service at the University of Minnesota and served as Minnesota's Commissioner of Health, where, among other things, I was responsible for establishing and overseeing Minnesota's medical cannabis program. Today, I offer some words of caution about legalizing the open adult use of cannabis before we have more information about the health and societal implications of such an action. When legalization of medical cannabis was discussed in 2013, Few scientific studies existed that documented its benefits. However, the studies that did exist suggested that medical cannabis had the potential to be effective in selected conditions. Thus, the legislature established a medical cannabis program that was as evidence-based as possible, included a limited number of conditions, provided for data collection and analysis, and allowed for the addition of new conditions as evidence emerged. Minnesota's medical cannabis program has demonstrated the benefits of this incremental, evidence-based approach and the legitimate place that cannabis has in medicines, pharmacopoeia. While the evidence about the benefits of medical cannabis increased, with the exception of decriminalization, which is an extremely important but separate issue, and an issue that I support, the decriminalization, no scientific studies demonstrate any non-economic benefits of legalizing open use of cannabis. In fact, existing research demonstrates that legalizing open adult use portends detrimental effects on our society. The negative effects of cannabis on the developing brain and driving under the influence are two of the most widely shared concerns. But information recently released by Boynton Health Service opens new areas of disquiet. The 2018 College Health Survey of over 10,000 students in 18 colleges throughout Minnesota discovered that regular cannabis users had significantly lower grade point averages than non-users. Cannabis, users had greater, cannabis use had greater effects on grade point average than alcohol use. Additionally, college students who have used cannabis within the last 30 days experienced sexually transmitted infections at a rate three and a half times higher than their non-cannabis peers and more than twice as likely to experience an unintended pregnancy, two and a half times as likely to be sexually assaulted, and twice as likely to experience domestic violence. Cannabis use is also associated with a nearly two times higher rate of various mental health conditions. These students are most likely using cannabis to treat their mental health conditions without the benefit of healthcare professional support, a behavior that would likely increase with legalization. The progression of illegal medical cannabis use in Minnesota has been deliberate, incremental, and evidence-based. Given that legalization of open use will be an irreversible decision with huge impacts on our society, this approach should not be abandoned. We should wait until we know more about the impacts of legalization of expanded use of cannabis. I suggest that a health impact assessment be done by the Minnesota Department of Health to gather that information. However, if a decision is made to legalize open adult use, 
the oversight of the program should be in the Department of Public Safety, not in MDH. Although MDH should be involved with data collection and assessment of the impact of legalization, it should not be responsible for oversight of the program because that would give people the wrong impression about its health risks. As a pediatrician and a public health professional, I cannot say that this is a drug that is safe or healthy for general use. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellinger. I notice that some members in the audience are very concerned about the time factor that some of our people are giving testimony. Uh, keep in mind that the proponents were given 30 minutes to talk. How they divide that time was up to them. We actually gave them closer to 40 minutes. Uh, the opponents are wanting to stay within their 30 minutes, but there's fewer of them, so some of them may talk a little longer. Some of them want three minutes, five minutes to talk. They're not limited to two minutes, uh, as was the choice made by the proponents. Just thought I'd let you know that. Uh, we're going to go on to Dr. Winters and then Chief Mike Goldstein from Plymouth Police Department. Dr. Winters. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. appreciate this opportunity. I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, have studied addiction since the late 1980s, most of that time at the University of Minnesota. So I look at this question of legalizing marijuana from a risk versus benefit perspective. Um, as I understand the research literature, it is my professional view that the risks far outweigh the benefits. Thus, I strongly encourage the rejection of the bill to legalize marijuana for Minnesota adults. We have enough problems with our two legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco. We do not need another illegal, sorry, legal intoxicant in Minnesota. The issue of commercializing cannabis is being pulled by several opposing forces. I come from the side that's more uh, is public health minded as we are interested in what the research science says about the adverse effects of cannabis use but also recognize that some compounds in the plant may have medicinal value. There are two prominent research national based sources that provide the basis for my opposition to the bill. One of them is a 2014 review of the research literature by officials at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They identified seven adverse health effects for which, in quotes, the evidence was the strongest when marijuana was used long term or heavily. Here are the seven. Addiction, altered brain development, cognitive impairment, learning impairment, poor educational outcome with increased likelihood of dropping out of school, increased risk of chronic psychosis disorders, particularly in persons who have a predisposition to such disorders, diminished life satisfaction and achievement, and the final one was symptoms of chronic bronchitis. The second prominent research report that impressed me was the 2017 one by the National Academy of Science. This committee concluded that there was either strong or moderate evidence that regular cannabis use contributes to these six negative health effects. I think you have a copy of that in the handouts. Here are the six. Increased risk of motor vehicle crashes, increased risk for lung cancer, lower birth weight of the offspring, obviously when maternal uh, cannabis smoking occurs. Again, cognitive impairments. Again, development of schizophrenia or other psychoses, highest risk among heavy users and those with predisposition, and also related to addiction. They call it development of problem cannabis use when there's early onset of use. Of these seven from the one report and 16 from the other, if you read these two reports, you will note that many of them are cited as being particularly problematic when use begins early in life. Also important to realize, as you've heard, uh, many of these uh, literature citations and literature sources that you draw upon are looking in the rearview mirror because it's based on the version of cannabis that's much weaker than we see currently available. And so that leads to, to many um, difficulties when we try to think forward about what might be the health effects. I do not believe that it's just a matter of time that marijuana will be legalized in Minnesota. It is true that many states have legalized it, but eight states have pushed back from legislative initiatives. If the state were to commercialize marijuana, in my professional view, another adding another addictive drug to legal status would result in several public health 
outcomes. A greater proportion of cannabis users will become addicted than are currently addicted. A greater percentage of individuals at risk for mental illness will develop a more severe form of mental illness. The highways will be less safe. A larger percentage of Minnesotans will use the drug than currently do. Right now, we have about 13% of Minnesotans have reported using marijuana at least once in the past year. My prediction is that would go higher. And I predict there'd be an increase among young people. I know that's a controversial topic. There's been data about what does it go up, does it go down. You have a slide uh, that I prepared of sets of states, one of the six states that have legalized it and the six that have not. You can see that the difference in youth rates are different. The youth rate is defined between 12 and 17. Um, higher rates in the pro-marijuana states versus the non-marijuana. It's early trend data. We'd have to see how things look out, but if you get some expert advice from epidemiologists, I think they can tell you more about how early trends look and how that might be portending of later trends or not. I encourage you to go down that road because the youth issue is very important. Uh, the one concern I have about youth is the uh, um, THC is the active ingredient in marijuana is very powerful. It affects multiple regions of the brain, and people are very concerned that those regions are very important for uh, brain development that occurs during adolescence. If, if we don't um, uh, like the way that marijuana is being used as a social justice tool, then we should fix the criminalization laws. If we don't like the medical marijuana laws in Minnesota, then we should fix those. But I don't think we go down that road by recreationalizing it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Winters. Uh, Chief Mike Goldstein, followed by Chief Andy Bolin. Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, and committee members, Chief thank Goldstein. you for the opportunity to testify in front of you this afternoon. I'm here representing the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association and the Minnesota Peace and Police Officers Association as well. I completely understand that there are different opinions on this issue, and while I respectfully attempt to understand the pro-legalization movement, I would ask that my personal and professional perspectives on this issue also be respected. Further, my testimony this afternoon is based on the proposed legislation to legalize the recreational use of marijuana and has absolutely nothing to do with the existing legal provisions that allow for medicinal use of cannabis. The thoughtful work that went into that legislation was carefully crafted and is attempting to provide a medical remedy to those with qualifying ailments. Based on the many irrefutable facts that have been gathered from credible studies and based on the vetted data from states that have legalized the recreational use of marijuana, I cannot fathom how this is a good idea for Minnesota. While I am philosophically opposed to the legislation, to the legalization of marijuana, if it is ultimately legalized, the proposed bill is fraught with problems. Also, if the proposed legislation is passed into law, there will be two undisputed beneficiaries, big marijuana and those that want to get high. Everything else related to this movement will be at a cost. Here is what we know. The tax revenues that will be generated from commercially available marijuana will pale in comparison to the costs associated with the expanded use of this substance. For example, in Colorado, the ratio of revenue to expense is for every $1 earned, they spend over $4 in expense due to the legalization of marijuana. California is also experiencing great shortfalls. We know that users will chase a bigger high and will demand products with higher levels of THC, which as a result will assist the illicit market in its distribution of marijuana. Further, we know the illicit tax-free market will flourish in that users will want to purchase their marijuana at a cheaper price than, it was than what is commercially available if this is passed. We know that some involved with the illicit trade in Colorado also operate legal dispensaries. They have a way of laundering their money. We know that traffic crashes will increase, which will result in more injuries and deaths. While the state is making positive strides with hand-free legislation to impact distracted driving tragedies, why are we adding to this volatile mix? In Colorado alone, marijuana-related traffic deaths have increased by 66%. Due to the high concentration of THC in some cannabis-based products, some users will have adverse reactions that cause behavioral incidents, 
As a result, we know that law enforcement will be called to more mental health disturbances by those who are experiencing a psychotic episode. Law enforcement is already inundated with the mental health crisis calls. Along with traffic crashes and other medically related calls for services due to impairment, the mental health concern due to THC overdoses, police, fire, and EMS resources will be further strained, causing local communities to combat potential staffing and increase cost considerations. Chief, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up. Okay. Um, we know that the current bill prohibits uh, employers from using marijuana as a disqualifier for employment. That's a problem for us in law enforcement. We know that Minnesota is known for excellent education, educational systems, health care, industry, and quality of life. It is one of the very best states to reside in, but I believe this will erode our quality of life. The legislature has worked hard to combat big tobacco over the last decade, and I wonder if we are poised to combat big marijuana 10 or 20 years from now when we realize what this social experiment has cost us. With that, Mr. Chair I, and members of the committee, I thank you for your time and request that this bill, as it's currently written, be voted down for the betterment of our state. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Goldstein. Uh, Chief Bolin. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Andy Bolin. I'm the Chief of Police for Faribault, Minnesota, and in my 30th year in law enforcement. Prior to being a police chief, I was a task force commander of one of the largest state's drug task forces, and I just finished a tour as the chair of the Violent Crime Coordinating Council for the state of Minnesota. I fully understand that many states are pushing for legalization, and I understand that there's pressure on our state as well. I respect the diverse opinions on this subject. I'm not here to testify before you saying that um, marijuana, people that smoke marijuana are all criminals, deadbeats, or addicts. We understand that there's a certain percentage of people that smoke marijuana responsibly. We also understand that there's some medicinal properties of marijuana, which was talked about in the previous bill passed by the state. Law enforcement often stands opposed because we're the first ones dispatched to that kid having an adverse effect from, from, from some strong illegal narcotic or a new synthetic drug. We're the ones that must deliver the death notifications to the families because their teenager was killed by somebody who's impaired. Even if we accept the detrimental impacts of an increased addiction, increased health care costs, increased mental health calls for service, which we're already inundated with, with police, increased underage use, and increased traffic fatalities, I ask, are we really a better state if we go this direction? I believe well-intending people make decisions, and they truly don't understand the side effects and how damaging this decision to legalize marijuana can be. I believe that our decriminalization of marijuana across the entire nation has already forced a thriving business and organization, our drug cartels, to diversify by producing more heroin and methamphetamine. They're going to make money one way or another, and marijuana is a big cash crop. Meth seizures in Minnesota are off the charts high, and they're still climbing. In the past month, even my local drug task force, 10 pounds of heroin, 70 pounds of meth, and 171 pounds, the largest seizure in the state. You may ask why these are related. The increase, these increases started when marijuana was legalized across the United States because it kind of took a cash crop away from the cartel. Making marijuana legal is not going to fix anything. It will only also increase our black market. As users want to get higher because they want a THC content that's higher, they're not going to want to pay for the state-approved THC level. They're going to want a higher THC. Uh, states that already have marijuana legal, the, the black market is, is off the hook high. On Thursday, I spoke with a Colorado officer uh, retiring in four months after a career working downtown Denver. I'd never met this guy. He was a brother of somebody that I work with. Uh, he said while they were observing uh, increased in state revenue and they admit there's some people that are responsible, they said overall the impression has been very negative for Colorado. Uh, some of his comments included increased teenage use, more traffic fatalities, more deaths to con due to consuming edibles. Uh, he had a guy jump off an eighth store building while he was working. Uh, and plus the increase in the black market. The Minnesota Chiefs of Police feel, just like the DEA, that it is a gateway drug. And if anybody tells you different, they're blowing smoke. Because legal tax, marijuana costs more. People have turned to dangerous synthetics in Denver. They're having daily responses to a growing homeless and addicted population that are using dangerous synthetic drugs because they don't want to pay for the amount. In summary, like many in this room, I've known people and my friends and family that have suffered from addiction and substance abuse. I wonder how an elected body who wisely promotes hands-free driving to reduce distracted driving, promotes drug courts, and is considered even raising the tobacco wage can think legalizing marijuana is a good idea. The Minnesota Chiefs of Police believe this is a bad idea for our state. 
and we do not believe we make, a, make it a safer and better state. Thank you for allowing me to address this committee. Thank you, Chief Bowen. Uh, we'll now end with the last two, Sheriff Kevin Torgerson and Sandy Melville. Mr. Chair and committee sure. members, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Torgerson with the Olmsted County Sheriff's Office in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm currently in my second year, second term as sheriff and 39th year in law enforcement, all here in Minnesota. I'm here today representing the 87 sheriffs in the state, as well as the Olmsted County Sheriff's Office. The 87 sheriffs are unanimously opposed to legalized marijuana in the state of Minnesota. I'm also aware that our Minnesota County Attorneys Association is opposed to Senate File 619. In addition to that, locally, our Public Health Department and our Community Services Department is very concerned about legalized marijuana. Minnesota Public Safety, including Minnesota State Patrol, Sheriff's Office, and local police departments are, have worked in conjunction with the Department of Public Safety over the last 15 years through a program known as TZD, Toward Zero Deaths. The TZD effort brings education, emergency medical and trauma services, enforcement, and engineering, the four E's, and courts and you, the legislators, together to bring traffic deaths from a high of 655 in 2003 to a low of 358 in 2017. Our goal is to continue bringing the numbers of deaths lower every year. In our county, we have had quarterly meetings where our highway engineers at all levels, our public health department and law enforcement, meet to review fatality and serious injury crashes. We have had very frank conversations how to improve our roads, focus on education efforts, and enforce the current laws to continue to saving lives. During this legislative session, you are also discussing the efforts to pass laws to stem the tide of distracted driving in our state. Changing behaviors of our drivers is a difficult task, as you all know. During the discussion of legalizing marijuana, you have naturally looked to our colleagues in other states as well as research readily available. The biggest challenge to, for law enforcement and public safety with legalizing marijuana is the potential for more drug drivers on our roads. More drug drivers on our roads is very difficult to manage. Currently, Minnesota agencies have trained DREs, drug recognition experts, in their agencies. This is not as easy as a prospective DRE officer must spend several weeks in training away from their agencies, which is paid by the state and federal funds, approximately $2,000 initially and $400 annually to keep them trained, plus the per diem. The per diem must be covered by individual agencies. Our agencies, all agencies, do not have the same amount of cash and availability to support this type of training. What is at risk? AAA has, and other research indicates 10 to 30 minutes after the last puff or inhale of marijuana, the, the average person feels the peak effects. Two to five hours after the length of time, a person is acutely impaired after ingesting marijuana. And two or more weeks after the last ingestation of marijuana, the driver can still have THC detected in their system. I'll try to finish up here. You undoubtedly have heard of the research showing that a person's brain is not fully developed until their middle 20s, hence the push for T21. The same issue is at hand with marijuana. Granted, it is not intended, but senators, I'm here to tell you today, our schools, our kids are feeling the pressure. Our kids are hearing that marijuana is safer when you know the research tells us the opposite. I'd like to remind you that the work you have done with medical marijuana is commendable. Please continue to the work and research. I leave you with this. What kind of state of Minnesota do we want? A safe Minnesota? Your law enforcement professionals are warning that legis legis legalizing marijuana is not a step for a safer Minnesota. We will not reach, out, reach our goal of towards zero deaths with legal marijuana. Please don't pass this legislation this year, next year, or at any time in the future. The consequences intended this year, next year, are difficult. Please do not change. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Uh, the next and final opponent is Sandy Melville. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Limmer and um, committee members. 
When you have kids, you want to keep, uh, excuse me, when you have kids, you only want the best for them and you want to try and keep them safe and teach them things to be successful in their life. Our 23-year-old son, Austin, was well on his way to a successful life and future. Austin graduated cum laude with National Broadcasting Society honors from Winona State in May of 2010. He was scheduled to start a broadcasting internship with the Minnesota Twins, and he had a wedding date set with his girlfriend. Austin was careful, Austin was cautious, and he always made good choices because he knew his life depended on it. Austin made all the right choices the night he was killed. He crossed in the crosswalk with friends, with a walk signal, and with their designated driver. Austin lost his life in an instant due to an individual who made the deadly choice to drive with a high BAC and THC metabolites in his blood. Austin was hit and killed on impact only one step from the curb. Imagine how awful and horrible it is to hope that your son's death was so swift so he didn't feel the horrendous pain of being hit by a speeding car and thrown 51 feet onto the sidewalk. Everything, everything was taken away from him in that instant. Everything that he worked for and achieved and we taught him to be was taken by a deadly choice made by an impaired driver. I can't tell you how much we miss him. I want to hear his voice, and I want to hear his laughter. And everything about Austin is gone. There is nothing worse in life than losing your kids. As a parent, you try to do your best to ignore the possibility that our children might die before us, because that's not supposed to happen. And when it does, there is a hole so deep, nothing will ever be able to fill it. Normal life is gone. You'll never understand this unless it happens to you, and I can tell you, you don't want this to happen. Nothing in life, nothing in life prepares you for the loss of your kids. Parents are not supposed to outlive their children. We have an empty chair at our dinner table. We have his empty bedroom down the hall. And we have an excruciating emptiness in our hearts and in our lives. Alcohol is legal, cheap, and easy to get, which results in an average of 24,000 Minnesota DUI arrests a year. One in seven, one in seven licensed Minnesota drivers has a DUI on their record. With the well-publicized DUI patrols over the Thanksgiving holiday, many people didn't heal, heed the warning. 480 arrests resulted in only four days. Only two weeks into 2019, the Iowa State Patrol reported that 45 DUI arrests were made in the state of Iowa. The Minnesota Office of Public Safety reported that 1,000 a thousand DUI arrests were made in Minnesota during that two-week time. Think about, how, about this, how safe are your kids and your families on Minnesota roads? Legalizing recreational marijuana will undoubtedly cause an increase in Minnesota DUI arrests. Then ask yourselves if the collateral damage of more innocent victims killed will be worth legalizing pot for the sole purpose of just getting high. My life mission now is to reduce the incidence of impaired driving on Minnesota roads and the tragedy, tragedies it causes. Please don't compromise the safety of Minnesota citizens any further, bypassing this irresponsible initiative. There is no rewind. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Melville, and on behalf of the Senate, we extend our sympathies regarding your loss. Uh, we'll now move on to our discussion and questions at this time. Uh, the members of our committee uh, wanted to direct your attention to the Senate review. Uh, it's written to the A-9 amendment that's before, with the A-9 as uh, an accepted uh, proposed amendment and 
That will give you a little better idea to follow along with the bill. We'll open it up for questions. Uh, who would like to begin, if any? Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure who this question should be directed at. I have several, actually, but but one of them we've we've spoken here quite extensively about the under the influence and the fact that there is an effect of marijuana. You obviously, most of you know, you get high, and one of the big issues that concerns me uh, is the correlation between the quantity of of THC in the system and the effect on an individual. We have pretty good studies that show that a certain blood at, a, at a certain blood alcohol content, everyone is impaired. That changes over the course with some people who are smaller, have different metabolism. But at some point in time, everyone is impaired. The question I have, and I'm not sure if there's here, someone here can answer it, at what point in the consumption of marijuana is someone impaired? Is there an objective test? Has there been an objective study? Is there any information at all that tells us when everyone is impaired? And that's the question that I would ask because this leads to many, many, many issues in terms of liability for commercial drivers, in terms of liability, but most importantly, in terms of understanding how much of this drug you should have in your system when you get behind the wheel. Mr. Chair. Franzen. Thank you, uh, Senator, Mr. Chair and Senator uh, Ralph. I, I think that's a valid question that most of us, if not all of us, have because cannabis is illegal. So, and technically, it's still illegal to drive impaired regardless of what substance you're using, whether it's opioids that your doctor prescribes today, <coughs> whether it's alcohol that you can buy legally in the liquor store, um, the question is, how are these states adapting to have testing that would actually help them um, police uh, our roads and making sure that they're safe? And what I've been told is that the, the science is there and there's been movement in that direction. Right now, people are driving um, when there's medical cannabis legal in this state. So um, I probably have that answer more, more um, uh, come from public safety because they do field sobriety. That's how they're doing it now. Um, but Senator, um, my co-author here also has some, some ideas of how to answer that question from a medical standpoint. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Preston. Thank you, Senator Ralph. <clears throat> Basically, alcohol and the, uh, if you will, the blood alcohol level, the BAC, it's a linear slope. Uh, you can put on the x-axis and the y-axis, and you can see that the more the BAC goes up, the more the impairment. With, alcohol, with a THC, uh, it's more of a parabola. And uh, many states have gone with, uh, some have gone with per se, where if there's any, uh, and it's actually not THC, it's actually a metabolite, it's carboxy-THC, and it isn't psychoactive. But the bottom line is some states will say anything at all is enough to be a contributing factor to an arrest, two nanograms per cc or five nanograms. And some states do none and just say we're just going to use in-field sobriety testing. It is extremely difficult, and that's one of the reasons why I think Senator Franz and I are so appreciative of the committee for having this hearing so we flush some of these, these issues out because clearly that's not settled science yet. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone from the law enforcement community that would like to address the issue of how to determine impairment uh, caused by marijuana? Sheriff? Thank you, Chair. Sheriff um, Torgerson. I mentioned it real briefly in my, in my comments um, related to DREs, drug recognition experts. Uh, not every agency has them. It's very expensive. And it's a, a very intensive amount of training to, to get there. Um, uh, the senator is absolutely right as far as uh, how to tell. Right now in Minnesota, it's a presence um, as to uh, if the drug is in the system, if, if marijuana is in there, um, the metabolites are there, it's, it's uh, under the influence, and that's, that's all we have. The DRE is simply able to determine whether or not the uh, drug is in the system. There's no way to know how much is in there and what is impaired. That's, that's the difficult part of it. And uh, at this point, yep, yeah, there's a lot of research. I think there's a lot of studies going on, but I don't think they found a definitive way to, to prove it and to identify what's safe and what's not safe. Right. 
Senator Ingebrigtsen? <laughs> oh, Senator Ralph. So I, I, I kind of would like to go back to the idea of the people who want to use marijuana responsibly. And I think there are many who do, and I think there are many who are very careful about it. But do they have any way of knowing when they are impaired and when they are not? I have a pretty good idea when I've had too much to drink, and I stay below that. I don't know how I would react with marijuana. And as I, I guess this is the question I have, that we need to be able to do that before we turn this loose on our society. And so I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Mr. Chair and Senator, Senator Ralph, and, and I agree. I mean, right now you probably look at your liquor bottle or your uh, beer can and say, you know, this has whatever percentage of alcohol content, and you kind of know because you hopefully drink responsibly in the comfort of your own home, um, and you know sort of how to measure what your body is able to tolerate. For cannabis, we don't have that. People are buying this stuff off the street, laced with whatever synthetic drugs, so they have no idea what they're consuming. So part of the responsible conversation that I think we're bringing today, not to say that this will pass today or tomorrow, is to talk about these issues. Like, I think there's a public interest in people knowing what they're consuming, what they're putting in their body, like a beer can, like a liquor bottle. You know how much content of alcohol is in there, and you have a way of knowing how your body reacts to that. Right now we have nothing. People are consuming um, edibles and they have nothing, they have no idea what's in a, in, in a cookie or in a, a gummy. Um, they know that it has an effect on them, but we have um, further educate the public of what is, cons uh, you know, what's considered safe. Mr. Chair. S Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sarah. We, because of medical marijuana, we are starting to dial in what a five milligram uh, gummy bear or tablet or edible, whatever we use. Uh, so, I mean, we're starting to see that. So patients that are on, say, uh, medical marijuana or medical cannabis for a seizure disorder, we know that five milligrams daily uh, may well take care of the seizure problem, uh, that 10 milligrams they experience adverse side effects. So we're starting to dial that in because of some of the medical marijuana experience we're gaining. Mr. Sarah, Chair, just one Sarah last Ralph. comment. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Jensen. Uh, being one of the co-chairs of, of the Medical Cannabis Commission, I am uh, very concerned about bringing medical cannabis to people because I think it has m a great benefit. And I think it also will lead to some me better measurement of the, imp the impact. But at this point in time, I think that the measurement has strictly been trying to look at does it relate to a specific symptom? Does it cure a specific ailment? And not looking at the overall effect of the, of the, of the high, so to speak, that is the impairment of judgment. And this is the key that I feel we have to look at. When is your imp judgment impaired? Because that's what this does. Thank you. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, members. Uh, those that know me, and I've been around for a while, um, know what I think of of this particular drug with my 34 years of experience in law enforcement. I think I, I uh, uh, actually, uh, with the medical marijuana, which by the way is one of the better, better bills in the country, medical marijuana, that was passed, much, much to my chagrin at the time. But I did say many times that this was the number one step towards legalizing recreational marijuana. And now, unfortunately, it, is, it has come true. And I'm not saying it's going to pass. Uh, but I do appreciate the discussion. Uh, doctor, I'm, I'm quite surprised that, that you would support this, uh, especially in saying that the, the, the substance isn't good for you. I, coming from a doctor, it just doesn't make any sense to me for anybody to say that. These are just a couple of comments I'd like to make with regards to the, to the uh, testimony. I know one of the, one of the parts is, is that the black market's going to go away. Everybody thinks that that's, that's going to disappear. Well, let's look at California. Everybody kind of likes to model themselves, it seems like. Or not everybody. Some around here like to model ourselves after California. I have an article here now that's, that's, uh, that's very clearly showing that the uh, governor, who's a DFL governor there, had to call out now the National Guard uh, to help law enforcement in California because they have such a overbearing uh, black market grow operation going on. They can't even, law enforcement can't begin to handle it. And this is a state that's had legalized marijuana for some time. So 
the testifiers are right. They are going onto the street to get the stronger dope. Um, going from a 3-2 beer to a, to, a, to a stronger beer, I mean, as a kid, that's what you did. And uh, it's not going to be any different here. I want to just finish, and, and I, I think people are going to know where I'm at, uh, Senator. And, and uh, the, the mother very clearly said and very heartfelt that we're not made to, to bury our children. And um, I delivered that message many times in my life. Doctor, you probably have too. Uh, but now I have grandkids, and I have great, actually a great granddaughter. And I'm very concerned about the message that we're going to be sending if we should legalize this to those kids. And I think of just the one scenario, and then I'm going to stop, uh, Mr. Chair, is mom and dad at home having a couple of joints for recreation. And I can appreciate that. I understand that. They can, they can have a couple of strong beers or a couple of strong drinks and relax. And maybe having some edibles. And maybe it's been a tough day and, and we want to relax and we fall asleep and we leave a couple of those edibles on the table, on the end table, and along comes the toddler who's now just starting to walk or maybe has been walking for a couple of years. And anyone in this room that thinks that that toddler isn't going to grab that piece of chocolate or that gummy bear uh, is totally misguided. And I can't imagine what kind of a tragedy we'd have to answer for and have to live with. So. Um, I can't support this uh, uh, moving forward, uh, especially with the, uh, with the THC content coming from in the 60s when I, was, when I was growing up and starting in law enforcement in the 70s. We called it ditch weed or Minnesota green back then. The sheriff can probably recognize that, that term uh, to something now that's very dangerous. I mean, we're talking some really strong stuff here, and, and uh, that black market's not going to go away. The state of Minnesota is not going to come out on the financial part of this. Please don't use children in schools to hide, to hide your reason why you want this. It just doesn't cut it. Anybody with any, any uh, feelings towards children will, will, will think that that's just foolish. So uh, thank you, though, for the dialogue. It's great. Uh, I think Minnesota deserves a, a, a decision today, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for holding the meeting. Mr. Sarah, Chair. Well, Sarah Jensen. I would like to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Britson. As you may or may not realize, I have immense regard uh, for your perspective. And uh, I agree with you. I cannot support this bill. But unfortunately, I've learned over the last two and a half years that sometimes here in St. Paul, in order for a conversation to be held, bipartisan support, bipartisan signatures on a bill will make it more likely. When Senator Franzen asked me if I would sign on to the bill, I asked her, what is your goal? And she said, we need to have the discussion. And it sounds like the two of you are in agreement. And I agree with you. I told her I wouldn't vote for the bill in the committee. I wouldn't vote for the bill on the floor. We thought that it might come to HHS, uh, but regardless of where it's heard. But I do think decriminalization is something that should be addressed, talked about. I do think the chemistry needs to be discussed. And I think hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans need to be heard. So for that, I am deeply grateful to this committee for doing so. Thank you. Senator Hall. Uh, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator France and Senator Jensen. Thank you for all the work you've done in this bill. Um, I think the approach to kind of being thoughtful, having the debate, looking at what the, some of the concerns are, is going to be really important as we walk this road to legalization, because I think that is the road we're walking. I had a couple things I wanted to bring up that um, for consideration, and maybe it's here in the bill now and I don't see it, and that is the THC concentration levels. Just like we've been able to limit concentration levels for alcohol, I think that's something that during the rulemaking process we also could do so that we don't have that problem where you know, maybe on the black market people were used to a, a lighter concentration, although even that I think has increased in concentration. Um, and that that's the one concern I have is being able to limit the concentration um, or at least label the concentration. And then the other one is um, edibles. I think are uh, the effect of edibles and the attraction to children, as was brought up, I noticed in your bill on page 16, 16.7 through 16.9, you talk about plain packaging, uh, tamper-proof, child-proof containers. I think that's going to be um, important if that applies to 
edibles, I'm not sure, but I think that would be really important, just like we've done that where we don't allow candy cigarettes, or at least the industry doesn't make them anymore. I think I had a bill to outlaw them maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and that flavored tobacco is also a problem, especially with um, e-cigarettes, that anything that could be more attractive to younger people, I think it's really important that we discourage in the bill. Thank you. Thank you. S Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Thank you for bringing this up. I, I uh, learned some things today. Um, and I think the major question that I heard today is, what do we want Minnesota to look like? How do we want to live here in Minnesota? And, uh, and I related that back to, what do I w want Minnesota to look like for my family? for my children and grandchildren uh, for the future. Uh, I, I want to say I'm not unsympathetic um, to those that need it. Uh, I'm carrying the medical cannabis bill. Um, and I heard today apnea. And I thought maybe that's a medical condition that should be covered by something like this. I know my son from Colorado likes the gummy bears when he goes to bed at night. Uh, so I know there's um, something that can really help there. Um, a buddy of mine um, said to me, he said, I feel happier. And I said, are you healthier? Is our society healthier because you're taking uh, a drug that makes you feel happy? It concerns me. What I'm looking at is a healthier society. And I think health is, the, is where this issue is really at. Uh, healthy children, healthy drivers, healthy in mind, body, and spirit, healthy workers, family, and in general, just a healthy public. And I know that if we legalize it, we will have a lot more people using it. Even myself, I'd say, boy, if it's legal, it must be okay. Let's try it. And it's not something I need. So uh, you're not going to get my vote today, but I do appreciate the discussion, and I, and I know the heart of the issue was we are really trying to help people. Thank you. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, I, I like uh, Senator Zingabritson and, and Ralph and Hall. I, I really do appreciate the hearing today, the conversation of uh, bringing um, all of the range of issues that are important in this uh, policy consideration uh, uh, to the public, to the media, uh, the opportunity to have legislators learn about it and have a conversation about it, um, and uh, uh, to consider what the path forward on this uh, should or should not be. Um, these are the kind of discussions which are healthy for our democracy and which give us an opportunity to fully uh, vet issues that come before the legislature, and we've now spent um, over two hours uh, doing it, which I think was uh, very important for us. Um, I've had uh, uh, concerns all along about, uh, about the concept of just flat out decriminalizing marijuana. I wanted to make sure that if we took that step that we uh, had a thorough analysis of, of how it's played out in other states what the regulatory structure um, has looked like there, whether it's been effective, what the impact has been on their communities, um, on, on the tourist community, as well as uh, on the, uh, the, the non-tourist community, um, uh, what the tax situation uh, has been, um, uh, what the impact has been on public safety and on individual health, uh, and uh, keeping in mind uh, that there is already a lot of marijuana use in Minnesota and all around the country. Uh, so it's happening, and people are out there driving on the roads now um, after having consumed marijuana. Uh, we do have drug recognition uh, enforcement officers specially trained to detect not just marijuana but all sorts of impairment uh, from substances other than alcohol. Um, we have it used recreationally, and uh, I would submit, as some have already told us, not just the, the medical conditions, but uh, my guess is in many quarters, mental health is improved um, for some individuals who are using it to uh, 
uh, to de-stress under certain circumstances, just like sometimes people relax having a drink of alcohol um, or two drinks of alcohol. The problem comes in when they drink to excess uh, and either they have a tendency toward um, addiction uh, or they do other things. They get behind the wheel, for example, when they shouldn't. Um, but uh, the use of alcohol is lawful in Minnesota. The use of cigarettes is lawful in Minnesota. That doesn't necessarily mean that each individual is going to do it or use it. Um, and uh, those are individual choices. And to some degree, that's, that's our rights um, as individuals. Uh, so I, 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 too, appreciate the details that have been raised, the work, the homework that's gone into preparing this proposal. I think um, this is a good conversation. Uh, personally, I would not like to see the conversation end with this committee hearing. So I would like to ask the chair, um, were this to pass, what would be the next procedural step? What would be the next committee? Uh, Senator Lapps, uh, in the event that this would pass, this bill would be moved to the Health and Human Service Committee. And I would venture to guess from there it would go to the Tax Committee. I'm not sure about finance. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, there is still a, a, uh, a lengthy procedural road for this bill. Um, I think uh, most senators aren't going to sit back and watch the tapes of this committee hearing. The only opportunity for other members of the Senate really to uh, have this thorough an understanding of this issue would be for them to sit in a committee hearing while they're listening to these kinds of conversations and presentations from the people are knowledgeable on all sides of the issue. Um, I also sense uh, there is not a consensus, perhaps, as to uh, whether or not this is a good thing for Minnesota. Uh, but in light of the comments uh, from Senators Ralph and Ingebrigtsen and Hall about the value of having the conversation, I'd like to move at this time that this bill be passed without recommendation and be re-referred to the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. And I would like to ask for a roll call and that the uh, uh, results be recorded in the journal. Senator Latz has moved uh, that this Senate file 619 as amended be recommended to pass without recommendation. And a roll call. Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to say I support that motion. I appreciate the authors bringing this forward. We had a lot of discussion, and Senator Latz mentioned it, and I think Senator Ingbertson mentioned, someone over there mentioned, people do go home and have a drink, um, and that is legal, and some people use that properly, and some people abuse it, and I think the same could be said of all sorts of um, tobacco is the same, and also marijuana. And so I think having this discussion is helpful, and I think going forward to continue the discussion and flush it out, um, I think that is, is really helpful. Um, I think it was Senator Hall mentioned he wanted a safe community, and I think we all want that. We want a safer and healthier, healthier Minnesota, and is having this regulated, does that help it? Does that make it healthier and safer, and people know what's healthy and what's safer? So that's why I am going to support Senator Latz's motion to um, continue that discussion. Any further discussion? Senator Ingerbert. Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, I think with the interest of the uh, people that are here and, and taking the time of the testimony, maybe a, a, a passing of this, uh, of, of this bill without recommendation should be explained, I think, a little bit further. Senator Latz, uh, you made the motion without recommendation. Um, I don't know if the public understands what without recommendation means. Um, usually we pass bills convinced that, it, that we would recommend to the next committee that they would consider passing it in an affirmative direction. Uh, without recommendation, uh, well, it's pretty obvious there is no recommendation. Uh, Senator Latz, do you want to ex expand on? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in most practices, uh, in committee hearings, we are asked as a committee to decide, do we like the proposal or don't we? And then viewing that proposal through the lens of our role on, in this case, a Judiciary Committee or whatever committee we're on, um, do we support it becoming law is the, really the question that's posed to us um, at that time. Um, and uh, But on occasion, 
Uh, we aren't prepared to make that decision. Do we, in fact, support this proposal becoming law in its current form or any reasonable facsimile of the current form? Uh, and uh, may not have made up our minds. We want to see what it's going to look like, but we also don't want to see it die for lack of any further conversation at this stage in the process. Uh, so sometimes you'll see motions uh, that we pass a bill, but not making a recommendation to the next committee or to the Senate as a whole as to what we think the final vote on the floor of the Senate ought to be. And personally, I'm, I would be withholding my judgment on what a final proposal would look like were it to get uh, to come before me again, probably on the Senate floor, if that's where I guess because I don't think it would go to Commerce Committee. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although maybe it would, who knows? Uh, but either either step, I would take into consideration the recommendations of the committees before me in judging that, and and then I'd see what the final bill looks like before I make a next vote on it, probably on the Senate floor. I'm withholding my judgment on that at the moment because I want to see how it plays out and what other committees have to say about it. Uh, but in, in, if we vote it down right now, then it ends procedurally uh, for all practical purposes and all likelihood right here in Judiciary Committee. And HHS wouldn't have the opportunity to learn about it in the detail that we have. Neither would Tax Committee, neither would uh, State Government Committee or any other committee that it might uh, go through. The other benefit is by the time it gets to the Senate floor, if it makes it through the process, most senators will have heard the bill in a detailed presentation and will have been in a position to make a more informed decision rather than relying solely or primarily on the discussion on the Senate floor about a bill. Uh, so in my experience as author of a complicated bill as they go through multiple steps, it's a lot easier to, to you know, explain what's going on and to have final decisions be, be informed if more members of the Senate have had a chance to sit through a hearing like this and to consider it in more detail. Uh, so uh, that's why I think uh, the Senate process would benefit, and I think uh, the people of Minnesota would benefit from having this discussion continue at the next committee step. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will take the roll. Senator Limmer? No. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Dietzik? No. Senator Hall? No. Senator Ingebrigtsen? No. Senator Johnson? No. Senator Latz? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Ralph? No. With a, vote, with a vote being three yeses and six, six noes, the motion does not prevail. Mr. Chairman? Senator Latz. Uh, a majority of this committee now having voted to end the conversation about this bill in the Senate for this legislative session, I move to table the bill. There's no debate on tabling the bill? I call for a roll call. And a roll call has the been The results asked. be recorded in the journal. And recorded in the journal. Uh, do I see three hands? There having been at least three hands, so we will take a vote on tabling the bill, and uh, it'll be recorded in the Senate Journal. The clerk will take the roll. Senator Limmer? No. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Dietzik? No. Senator Hall? No. Senator Ingebrigtsen? No. Senator Johnson? No. Senator Latz? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Rell? No. Mr. Chair. With a vote of three yeses, six noes, the motion does not prevail. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chair. Senator Latz. Um, unfortunately, we, we seem to have a partisan divide here on whether or not this bill ought to end its pathway here this year in the Senate um, or not. Uh, I'm going to offer what I hope will be an opportunity for a bipartisan uh, method to gather more information um, uh, to consider uh, this proposal, and that is uh, the A8 amendment. I'd ask that it be distributed and we consider the A8 amendment. Sir Ralph. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that the, the problem is, at least in my mind, is, is that 
uh, this bill is just not ready for prime time. There's too much missing information. And from the testimony, and this is the, re the very, very reason I ask some pointed questions, that I don't think we ha know enough about this. And all the talking in the world is not going to improve that, that status of the information. So I think that rather than spend time in the, spend our legislative time talking about something that we don't just don't have enough information literally in the, in the body of information is counterproductive. I am certainly not against continuing the conversation and I think there are other ways this can be done without occupying valuable legislative time and I certainly would welcome any suggestions in terms of ongoing inquiry into this matter. But I feel at this time that in order to allow this to properly be, be looked at, we, we need to remove it and let, let's step back and take a look at it. And then that was the reason that I am voting in the, re the direction I am. Mr. Chairman. Senator Latz. Um, Senator Ralph just made the, the most articulate statement in support of the A8 amendment that I could imagine. Uh, the A8 amendment would establish a task force to do exactly what Senator Ralph just described. Uh, to assemble um, a, a broad cross-section of people who uh, know and would be impacted, would have a stake in the outcome here, to gather the kind of information that uh, perhaps Senator Rell feels is missing uh, from this process, uh, to see if it exists out there in, in the hands of those uh, perhaps who were not present here to testify or were not aware of that information, um, and uh, to report back uh, to the legislature by January 1st of 2020 uh, with uh, their uh, recommendations or findings regarding the legalization of cannabis, including a, a comprehensive plan um, uh, developed pursuant to Subdivision 5 of this amendment, uh, which includes identifying and studying the potential effects of legalization on public safety, public health, tax policy, regulatory oversight, consulting with experts and government officials uh, in other states, um, looking at what statutory changes would be necessary, taxation issues, uh, local and state regulation, um, education of the public, uh, funding relating to substance abuse disorders, uh, uh, which frankly we already know exist with regard to uh, uh, marijuana, um, and expungement of nonviolent marijuana convictions, uh, security relating to retail and manufacturing, the safe handling of proceeds, including banking options, policies that uh, promote access to the market from per to persons from communities that are disproportionately impacted by the ban, including incentives for minority-owned businesses to participate in this industry, um, statutory and policy changes designed to discourage operating motor vehicles who are under the influence of cannabis, which would go directly to some of the concerns raised by Senator Ralph um, and others, and in which, frankly, I share as well, probably everyone in this room does and uh, other recommendations uh, to the legislature about how to handle this. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, we can have a uh, bipartisan, uh, even unanimous support for setting up a task force to gather the information uh, that are raised by the questions and the testimony here today. Um, and uh, I would expect, frankly, uh, uh, Senator Jensen as well as Senator Franzen, uh, given their backgrounds uh, and, and uh, desire for data and knowledge um, would also lend their support to the A8 amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Senator Latz, just one question with regards to the amendment. Uh, in taking the information of expungement, especially in that particular area, is, is it going to be taken into consideration, at least through your view, that, that uh, the uh, folks that are uh, sitting in prison that are that are uh, that have con been con been convicted of using. Are you going to take into consideration that those particular cases and a lot of the cases that I am familiar with, because I came from that world, is is that if you're dealing uh, and and uh, you're caught dealing marijuana or whatever any other drug, uh, it's a lot easier for the uh, sometimes the prosecution to say I'm overworked, we're understaffed, uh, we're going to go ahead with a we're going to go ahead with a possession instead of a a, uh, a a dealing charge uh, is that going to be taken into consideration because I know there's an awful lot of people sitting in prison right now that are saying they're here only because I'm a user and actually in fact you were dealing you just happen to 
dealt away the, the uh, more serious of a crime. Senator Latz. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, on line 3.12, uh, it just makes reference to expungement of nonviolent marijuana convictions. Um, and uh, the task force would be tasked with the duty of, of evaluating what that means, um, all the issues surrounding expungement, and they may well come back and say, uh, you know, for example, convictions that started out as charges for sale but ended up with convictions uh, for possession are the kinds of things they're not comfortable with expungement uh, for, or there ought to be some other way of distinguishing these. I would think that whole range of, of uh, considerations would be within the purview of the task force. That would certainly be my intent. Um, and see what they have to say about it. And keep in mind that uh, the task force would be populated uh, by uh, uh, quite a, a broad group of people, including uh, uh, law enforcement representatives from the County Attorney's Association, the Sheriff's Association, the Chiefs of Police, the Police and Peace Officers Association. Um, so there, the input from that portion of the stakeholder community would be received as a part of this task force, and I would expect the report would include exactly the kind of analysis that Senator Ingebrigtsen and you're raising. Thank you. Any uh, further discussion on the A8 amendment? Um, I, I would be interested as to the position of the uh, the author and the co-author on the uh, oh, legislation. Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Latz. I, you know, to continue the conversation, um, this is a natural path forward. I, I, I believe the governor has his ability to also convene uh, people in similar task force. I think it sends a better message that we're interested in finding the right answers and all the data that could potentially inform us if there is to be a, a bill in the in next session. Frankly, um, I can spend 24-7 working on just this bill. There's just too much information and coming from different um, groups and it's hard to assess what's bias and what's not so the learning I have is to keep your open mind and I think a task force with the composition that's been laid out uh, would put us in that right direction and keeping um, those interests in mind and and bringing that those type of uh, concerns that we've heard today and take more time to delve into the the deeper issues of potency distracted driving um, health risk etc uh, so I do support the amendment, and I'll let Senator Jensen respond for his um, opinion on it. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Franzen. I would speak in favor of the amendment, though I would consider uh, two areas to further amend it at some point in time. One, I'm not certain that January 1st, 2020 would be uh, a doable um, target date if you're going to be doing six or seven months of interim work that might be overly ambitious. That would jump out at me. And then the second thing would be in the composition of the uh, task force. I would uh, probably think about putting in a couple, at least uh, a couple of physicians that do indeed prescribe medical cannabis because that is really, if you will, uh, a, a big part of the Minnesota data that we'll have. And it, it calls out different things, but I, I, would, I would make certain that I have at least a couple of physicians. I am not one. I did not get certified, but I think that might be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman? Sir Latz. I appreciate uh, Senator Jensen's suggestions. Um, I would like to uh, add uh, um, a, a task force, uh, or probably paragraph 21 on page 2, so it would be after... Uh, after line 19, insert another line, it says something to the effect of uh, two physicians with experience prescribing medical cannabis. Um, and then um, I think, I don't know about the January, 20, January 2020 date, um, if there's a way to add, we would have time, well, next session, Next spring is going to be a shorter session uh, because it, it'll not be a budget year. On the other hand, we probably won't start until beginning of February in all likelihood anyway. So I don't know if another month would be helpful. Um, I suspect if the task force felt that they weren't able to complete their work in time to give us a meaningful report, they'll, that'll be part of the report. And then we can take that into consideration as well. Uh, I think maybe to address that concern on line 3.22, 
Uh, if we could delete the word January and replace it with February, uh, that would at least give another month there, and then we'd have a full session to evaluate it at that point. Um, and, uh, oh, yes, and the line 3.28, same change. Benson, do you have an opinion on this correction? Mr. Chair and Senators, I, I, I agree with the changes. Um, I mean, we can figure out what else we need, because the two per, one person of experience working in public health policy could be a physician, so I was thinking what other physicians we need in this group, but I think that's tackled by the public health piece, potentially. Um, so I, I support the friendly amendment to the amendment. So, Senator Lads, I'm not sure if Council got everything in that, that long oral amendment, but... I, I can I'm going to I'm going to risk asking them to repeat what you just said, Mr. Backus. Uh, Mr. Chair, and members. Um, first off, uh, on line 3.22 and 3.28, you would uh, delete January, insert February, uh, and then I think we might want to tweak a little what Senator Latz said uh, earlier. I think it would be. We would delete on line 2.17 end and then 2.19 before the period insert semicolon end and then 22, it would be clause 22. And then I would suggest something to physicians with, exper with experience, who have experience with the medical cannabis program uh, because they don't technically uh, prescribe uh, medical cannabis is my understanding. So I think you'd just say maybe experience with the program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I accept those, uh, that drafting by council. Right. I see Senator Jensen has nodded his head in agreement. Um, so I uh, move to amend the eight amendment as just described by council. All right. Does anyone have any questions regarding the oral amendment described by council? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment passes. Thank you. Uh, we now have the bill before us. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Latz. the amendment before us. Oh, the uh, oh, you said bill. That was the amendment oh. to the amendment. I'm sorry. Yeah, so now we have the amendment. Now they have the amended amendment before and, and us. Mr. Chairman, if I may just, because I'm not sure everyone in the audience has seen a copy of the amendment, just so they think it's not just uh, the law enforcement community that I described as members of the task force, but to summarize for them. Uh, there will be a couple of members of the legislature from the Senate and the House, as well as uh, commissioners or designees uh, from the Departments of Agriculture, Health, Public Safety, Attorney General, Public Defender, Revenue, Labor and Industry, Human Services, and Commerce, uh, as well as uh, um, a person with expertise in the treatment of substance abuse disorder, a patient, medical cannabis patient. Um, cultivation and distribution of medical cannabis in Minnesota, public health policy knowledge, uh, two persons from separate non-cannabis industry organizations who advocate for cannabis legalization, an elected official in a statutory home rule charter city, an elected county official or administrator appointed by the Association of Minnesota Counties, um, as well as the others. And I will note for the record, uh, all members would serve without compensation. So now at least the members of the audience and the public have a much better sense of the, of the breadth of this task force uh, that would bring all of their experience and knowledge and information uh, to the report to help the legislature decide next year uh, what to do and how to do it if we move forward. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask for a roll call and uh, that the uh, uh, results be recorded in the journal. Do I see three hands? There will be a roll call. Uh, any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, the clerk will take the roll. Senator Limmer? No. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Dietzik? Yes. Senator Hall? Senator Ingebrigtsen? No. Senator Johnson? No. Senator Latz? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Ralph? No. With a vote on the A8 amendment, uh, there being three yes votes and six no votes, the motion does not prevail. Senator Ingerbritson. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, members, we've had this discussion now uh, for some time, and, and uh, I think everybody's ready to be 
coming out of here with some kind of a resolve one way or the other that needs an up or down vote. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I move Senate file 619 as amended to pass and re refer to Health and Human Services. And I'd ask for a roll call vote. Roll call vote has been asked, will be granted. Mr. Chairman. Senator Latz. Um, now I'm sitting here a bit stunned uh, because despite all the rhetoric from the members of this committee on that side of the table, it appears that the entire purpose of bringing this bill up in committee today was to kill it. And we, someone ought to just go ahead and make that explicit because I've no doubt now with this vote on the task force that every member of the Senate. Mr. Chair. Senator Latz. That we're going to have another five to three or six to three vote um, on this proposal. Uh, and I do not understand <coughs> why that would be, especially given the fact that some of the members of this committee explicitly said we need more information. Uh, I want more information. And if this is the way we're just going to shut down debate on a bill that I think the last poll showed 80% of Minnesotans yeah. want, then I, I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm really stunned um, at that. I think the chairman ought to give the chief author of the bill the courtesy of an opportunity, if she wishes to do so, to withdraw this bill from consideration at this time before we take a vote. Uh, Senator Latz, um, you made a comment about shutting down debate. We have not shut down debate. We gave this bill a very lengthy hearing. We gave everyone an opportunity to be equally represented for and against the bill. Uh, there may be some members that may be convinced by the testimony that's been prepared today and given to this committee. Uh, there may be some members that have heard enough and have been convinced one way or the other and are willing to make their decision now and stand by it. Uh, everything, there is no shutting down of debate, Senator Latz. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we will proceed. Mr. Chair, I'd like to withdraw S the bill. S Senator Franzen? I'd like to withdraw the bill. Uh, that, I believe, would take a vote by the committee. I don't know. Council? Let's ask Council to see if they uh, can give us direction. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, what, what is the exact question? Uh, can can the chief author request a committee to withdraw a bill without an action by the committee? Um, Mr. Chair, I think that would go down to custom and practice in the Senate over the course of the Senate's history. And I think that generally, my experience is that generally authors in situations are allowed to do that, but I don't think there's any rule that says you have to do that. It's really how the committee wants to proceed. Uh, I believe there is a motion on the, that we're being considered. Senator Ingerbritson moved that uh, Senate file 619 as amended be recommended to pass. A roll call has been asked for and granted. That's the order of business that we have before us right now. Hearing no further uh, discussion Mr. on this Chairman, motion. Just for the record, if I may, I, I don't recall if I actually asked for the roll call on Senator Ingebrigtsen's motion. Senator Ingebrigtsen asked for that roll oh, call, I'm and sorry. I stated it immediately after he okay. said it. Thank you. We have the motion before us. And that will be recorded in the journal, Mr. Chairman? Um, three hands. Do I see three hands? Yes. I see three hands. Senator Latz. Uh, hearing no further discussion, uh, Senator Inger Ritson moves Senate File 619 as amended be recommended to pass and move to Health and Human Service Committee. Clerk will take its roll. Senator Limmer? No. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Dietzik? Yes. Senator Hall? No. Senator Inger Ritson? No. Senator Johnson? No. Senator Latz? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Relf? No.
Uh, the motion does not prevail. Uh, with a Mr. vote Chairman? of three, I'm sorry. with a vote of three yeses and six noes, the vote or the uh, motion to pass does not prevail. Mr. Chairman, Senator Latz. It sounds like that concludes uh, this item of the agenda for this hearing. I, I would ask the chairman uh, to give uh, the uh, two gun bills to reduce gun violence that are pending before this committee the same courtesy that the chairman has given to Senator Franzen. Um, and that would be a uh, almost three-hour hearing to learn more about the proposals, to allow the public to understand the details of the proposals, because I'm finding in my conversations with many people who are opponents of the bills that they don't know the details of the bills. Um, and then we can, uh, like this bill, we can have the members decide what they think about the proposals, uh, vote on them, um, and, uh, and then the public will know where this committee stands. Uh, if the goal is to not shut down conversation in the Senate, um, then I think we should have a full vetting of those two gun violence reduction proposals that I'm the chief author of in this committee as well. And clearly, we have the time on the schedule uh, because we just did this one here today um, also, and I've been asking for a hearing like this for a year and a half. Sir Latz, um, as you are aware, um, leadership is asking to weigh in on whether your bills are going to be heard by this committee or not. I'm giving them the courtesy to do so. Um, you may know that we have close to 300 bills that want to cram into our deadline weeks. And we're trying to do as much justice for everyone we possibly can, but there will be a number of senators with legislative proposals that will not get heard uh, during this time. So. Uh, I am still waiting for leadership to give a green light to your bills. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator Latz. Um, last I checked, the chairman of this committee was the senior most Republican uh, in the Senate and is part of the leadership of the state Senate. This proposals uh, have been around in one form or another from the beginning of session in 2018. And we are now halfway through the session 2019. There's been more than ample opportunity uh, on the committee's schedule to hear these bills. Uh, so I'm asking for the uh, these hearings, Mr. Chairman. I'll pass it on to leadership. Senator Pappas. Um, Mr. Chairman, as long as we're on the topic, there have been a number of bills that were that have passed on a bipartisan basis and met the deadline in the House. Uh, when bills pass in the House uh, by the first deadline and have bipartisan support, is it your intention to hear those over in the Senate? Uh, we are looking at each one of them separately. Just because the other body happens to pass something by a certain deadline, it does mm -hmm. not obligate us to pass something by the second deadline. But we are two different political parties, and therefore we have two different political philosophies on how we approach issues. I understand, Mr. Chairman, but there were statements made by your leadership that there was going to be an effort to pass bills that appeared to be non-controversial and to be consensus bills. And so I'm really looking to the leadership of this committee to live up to that commitment. Yeah. We'll be reviewing every bill. Thank you. Thank you. No further business before the committee. We stand adjourned.